And Fat Man on Batman, I've been, I mean, shit, I'll be honest with you. I started the podcast because I was like, I can't wait for the Dark Knight Rise. I can't wait to even talk about it. So we're going to talk about it. Um, and when I talk about movies, I'll be honest with you, the person I love to talk about movies the most in this world is a guy that I made movies with the most in this world, man. He's my co-host from Smodcast. Um, he was the battery and still is and so many things that I fucking do. The enabler, uh, the guy that was always there who's like, yeah, shit, let's go make some fucking art and whatnot. Uh, my partner in crime, my bro, Scotty Moe. Say hi to the kids. Uh, hello. Okay, now, Scott, you know, traditionally on Fat Man on Batman, we've spoken only to people who've been involved with Batman in some way. Um, <laughs> Scott. Today. Today we're going to really go off the beaten path because, as I said, I couldn't think of anyone better to talk to about Batman or any movie with than Scott. As all of America uh, went out to see The Dark Knight Rises this weekend, Scott was one person who was like, I'll get there. <laughs> so Scott hasn't seen uh the dark knight rises at all so i haven't yeah and he's seen the other two you've seen batman begins i saw batman begins with you in vancouver in vancouver why were you up show. there i think i was visiting my folks <clears throat> down south i was shooting catch and release yeah all right so there's fucking there's something here yeah. connection <laughs> <laughs> see kids it is fat man on batman and scott is a relevant yeah. guest yeah, that's right. We saw Batman Begins together. And I remember coming at out at the midnight show. Which is like the only midnight show I think I've ever been to in my entire life. Yeah, as you can hear, Scott's very sleepy. If you've never <laughs> heard Smodcast before, you're doing yourself a real disservice, man. And, and guess what? You're going to have to hear Smodcast because I think we're going to continue this show over into Smodcast. We're going to start on Fat Man, Batman, go over to Smodcast. It's going to be a crossover like when Batman and Robin met the Green Hornet. And Cato, I have to put everything in terms that they'll understand. <laughs> Scott's looking okay. at me like, why are you talking to them like they're idiots? It's about Batman. It's using Batman references. So gotcha. we'll probably cross over. But That's it, not new, in case you're wondering. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> you using Batman references for everything? <laughs> it does kind of go That's back. That's pretty much. I measure things in, in terms of, of Batman, sometimes Jaws. Yeah. But Batman is truly the moral barometer. And Scott, over the course of 20 years, has had to listen to me talk about all manner of Batman shit. Uh, or say things right when like... Right we met... Hey, hey, this actually... This show could work. Right when we met... <laughs> this show could work. <laughs> Scott's like, I'm but just I, flailing I, out here, but you know what? I see some purchase, man. I had no idea why you invited me to do this show. <laughs> well, we were... Um, when we first met in Vancouver... Yeah. It was... Um, Batman Returns was on the verge of oh opening. God, you're right, man. Yeah. We got like a lot of Batman in our deal, relationship. Yeah. And then we went to see Batman Returns with me, your sister, you, and what was it? Buffy. Friend? Buffy. Bus no. Was it Buffy? No, it's Buffy. <laughs> is it? You still love You're like, is it Busty? Busty? <laughs> well, I think I think there's No, it was Buffy. Buffy. <laughs> uh, so anyway, we all went to see Batman Returns in Vancouver. Yeah, yeah, it was in Vancouver. On the fucking, on Granville at the like famous players. Or I don't remember like which theater, but we did definitely go. Um, and that was, I remember uh, being like, wow, that went dark. Like that went dark, you know, compared to. Compared to. Um, well, the, it compared to the first Batman, like you got to remember 1989's Batman for, for those of you that are like, you know, there are a lot of kids, man, who are like, this is my trilogy. You had Star Wars and I've got Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy. Like it's religion for him. Yeah. And when you try to tell them about like, hey, man, back in 1989, it was fucking nuts. People were cutting Batman in their heads, fucking like yeah, yeah, yeah. shirts everywhere. It was mad. It was huge. Um, but that movie, when it happened, we were all Batman fans were so fucking delighted because like, finally, a dark representation of our hero. We'd only really had in mainstream media the Batman Adam West show. Yeah. So when Tim Burton's Batman comes along and Batman's more dark and brooding and stuff like that, we're like, this fucking... This is the true Batman. That Adam West shit was a fucking abortion, and it should be buried deep in the bowels of the earth. Ironically, now fucking the, our version of what was dark and shit is like pink and candy coated yeah, yeah. compared to what Nolan wound up doing with it. So now you hear kids talking the same way about the 1989 the, Tim Burton Batman that we talked yeah, about. That started it. everything. Oh, it's crazy. But anyway, the 1989 one was a little gothic and emo and shit. But in the Batman Returns. It went darker with the fucking baby getting thrown into the sewer and and yeah and uh, penguin dies at the end the penguin funeral yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff very more probably uh, more Tim Burton esque than definitely the more 
Tim Burtony. So he, uh, so we come out of that movie, and I remember going like, "Wow, man, they went dark." <laughs> My God, they went dark. I mean, did you see, like when that penguin had a missile strapped on his back? <laughs> what does that say about humanity, Scott? <laughs> it says about my soul. That penguin is my soul, Scott. <laughs> and that missile is pain. I don't think I've seen that movie in a long. Batman movie. Returns. Yeah, yeah. My favorite moment of that movie, ironically, does involve the penguin with a missile on his back. <laughs> I was just pissing on it, but it, it is. It, there, he's in the bat ski boat, the bat skiff, and he's yeah. in the sewers heading to the fucking penguin, which in in the Dark Knight Rises, whole thing, there's a plot line takes place in the sewers of Gotham, and it is a fucking 180 degree portrait from cartoony sewers of Gotham yeah, to yeah. fucking, but Real. still in both, I, I gotta ask, who builds sewers this big? Is there really a room in, in, the, in every sewer system under every city that's like like a big, massive staging area. It seems like such waste of space. Whenever you see the inner bowels of a city in a movie, yeah, yeah, a lot of headroom. <laughs> you know, a lot of so for really tall people, yeah, and just like all this space where you're like, where are the pillars? What's holding this up? Like it clearly, the earth would just crumble under it. You know what I'm saying? Like there's nothing really holding. I don't know. It's cavernous. They build these cavernous fucking sewers. <clears throat> I guess they're just movie sewers, man. But even yeah. in Nolan's version. His movie sewer looks like like a movie sewer. Like this looks a little too suspiciously big. Anyway, I digress. Um, the uh, the the when he's in the bat ski boat and he's heading to fight the penguin, and Batman returns. Yeah, and all of a sudden, two penguins pop up with missiles, so fucking candy coated missiles. Like uh, they look like candy canes. Yeah, shoot them off the, their backs, and like you know, little helmets come down with fucking laser some guidance sighting system. guidance system yeah, shit yeah. and fucking boom the missiles go off their back and batman michael keaton is batman pulls back on the stick and then you see the bat skiff circle the tunnel yeah miss the missiles and then you go behind it and you're also behind the penguins who are watching them go and then you cut into the bat ski boat or the bat skiff and Michael Keaton as Batman is writing himself, and this is a horrible bit to try to do on a podcast. So, I, because I, I always, when I talk about it, I always can do it visually, but he looks back slightly. Like, yeah, just kind of glances, like, just glances back as if to say, I can't believe I was almost killed by two penguins with <laughs> missiles. You know, it was, I love that moment in that, in that movie. Um, in that movie, you had Catwoman, and that Catwoman, we were all like, oh man, fucking finally. It's been defined. And yet, she was not remotely close to the fucking comic book cat woman like yeah. she was selena kyle but she worked for max shrek she was a secretary mousy and then she got killed by this guy and she got licked by some magic cats and came yeah. back to life in the out yeah pussy up his <laughs> ass um but and then she started you know came back and uh, you know life's a bitch now so am i and was tough girl but it, it was more like she was possessed or something but we all love the outfit and she had the whip yeah so we all like responded to that that was cool and just seeing them kiss and and fucking fight on the rooftop and shit and also prior take to that what you can get pretty much like it's it's basically like being like a kid in 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 maybe uh, early high school and shit and you know you're like i got the third base you're like oh shit man everyone's yeah, like yeah. that's amazing and you live off that third base for like fucking months yeah till somebody else maybe could let you third base and now in retrospect you're like third base yeah, it's not enough. why didn't you just ask so her, like, can returns, i jerk off in front of you batman returns the equivalent of like a little titty the moral here kids is so don't batman returns <laughs> it's pretty much the equivalent of getting your dick having having your dick photographed by a cell phone camera yeah. in the midst of your most embarrassing and personal act ever that's the best review i think anyone's ever given batman returns man it's not well reviewed I, it's not even, who cares how well reviewed it is Nobody's ever reviewed it that way. <laughs> yeah, no one's ever talked about it. Has anyone talked about it in years? I I, it, I saw Batman Returns, Batman something. What was the what was the Tommy Lee Jones, Jim Carrey one? Batman Forever. Batman Forever. Whoa. Yeah, that was where things started to slide. Uh, but then, believe me, we all missed Batman Forever when Batman and Robin came out because that was the one. I think I was, saw all three of those with you in the theater. Ice to see you. That was Arnold Schwarzenegger. And yeah. then fucking, uh, you know, everyone like craps on Schwarzenegger in that movie. And I'm not saying like, leave him alone. But you know who's really awful in that movie is fucking Uma Thurman as Poison Ivy. And I'm not saying she can't act. We all know Uma Thurman can act. But 
their vision of poison ivy and her performance oh it is so fucking like huge dude hugely over the top but bane is also in that movie that's the first cinematic representation yeah, of bane which he's, is literally just like he's like a balloon yes and they just kind of inflate him and he's a henchman yeah for a woman yeah which we'll get into at the similarities oh. in the forthcoming dark knight rises discussion so okay we did see batman returns together years later in vancouver again ironically but at a different multiplex we saw batman begin at that new paramount that they yeah. built well it's no longer new it's been there for a while but when we were first in film school there was no paramount when i went back to shoot catch and release years later there was a paramount so we saw it a big ass fucking screen yeah yeah and i remember coming out afterwards and we chit-chatted with some dudes after the screening out front yeah. remember like some randys and chicks they were like hey man you're that guy and we started chit-chatting about the movie and whatnot and I remember coming out, my big impression of Batman Begins was like, wow, it was earnest. Like, it's really earnest. Because yeah. we were used to the Tim Burton Batman, which had some levity. Jack Nicholson as the Jokers chewing up the scenery and shit like that. Even Danny DeVito's performance was way over the top. Everything was kind of big, though not campy, as they did it in, in the Batman TV series. Although it became campy by the time they got to Batman and Robin. Yeah. So coming out of Batman Begins, I was like, man, this shit's earnest like yeah, yeah this ain't a this ain't a batman movie it feels more and i'd said it back then i was like this feels more like a cop movie and the cop just happens to be wearing tights yeah <clears throat> very serious and whatnot that was a movie that i liked the first time i saw it, but i wasn't like over the moon about it. i was like all right well i guess batman begins um <laughs> <laughs> but that was a movie that you revisit it and you wind up liking it more and more a movie that truly for me benefits from home video and shit because you can skip some stuff you don't want to yeah. watch go right to the cool shit um, it's a movie when you watch. It's the first time that Chris Nolan directed a Batman movie. And Chris Nolan at that point was known as the dude who did Memento. Memento, the movie told backwards and shit. I mean, he had done did... following pre prior to that, but Memento was his big breakout movie. And then he did a Warner Brothers remake of uh, Insomnia. Um, yeah. So they announced now what had been going on historically at that point was uh they had been developing batman year one with a homie that made the black swan uh, uh aronofsky darren aronofsky yeah so that was put aside and all of a sudden you heard hey the guy that did uh the the movie with, the, with al pacino the fucking uh i can't sleep movie they're giving him the new batman franchise yeah and they're gonna call batman begins so we saw that movie very earnest very, very like, earnest and and real world didn't look like it was shot on a sound stage no nope. batman returns batman the 1989 batman um all of those batman movies the tim burton slash uh, joel schumacher batmans all shot on sound stages like you know yeah. gotham was built from the ground up and batman from and by anton first who later wound up uh, i think he didn't kill himself he I died know. I don't know if he killed himself. I don't want to say if he did, but he died. Anton first, the guy that designed the, the Tim Burton the original, Batmobile yeah. and all of Gotham city um, wound up not living very long after that. So those Gotham's were built. Suddenly Batman begins. This dude's using Chicago as Gotham, you know, and where you're like, wow, that's a fucking good yeah, idea. Yeah. Like it looks real. Everything looks real. Everything about Batman begins <clears throat> looked real it was like he I'm, tried to he rooted the movie in reality wholly in reality and even you know so much so that the villain was Raz al Ghul really like you know there was a scarecrow but his mask was explained away so it wasn't a dude in a costume and shit yeah. um and then Raz al Ghul um who was Henry Ducard but then reveals himself to be Raz al Ghul and and I should say for the record man we're gonna spoil fuck out all these movies so if you haven't seen them or you're like, I don't want to know, fucking tune yeah, out, yeah. go do your duty, and then come back. So Raz al Ghul, he's not even a villain that lends himself colorfully. Even like Liam Neeson was wearing suits and shit like that. Yeah, yeah. It was like probably a nightmare for Warner Brothers going like, these are our figures? The fucking Scarecrow's wearing a suit and a bag on his head? And fucking <laughs> Liam Neeson is a figure? Is the action figure? <laughs> yeah, this, this guy looks like Qui-Gon. What are we going to do? <laughs> Where's the Jack Nicholson the Joker? But to be fair, 1989, when Batman came out, they were all caught with their pants down. They didn't have fucking toy deals in no, place. No, no. They had one shitty little toy deal with Toy Biz um, to make action figures. And what they did was repackage the Batman figure from the Kenner Superpowers line. Yeah. And they did a repaint of the Joker from the Kenner Superpowers line. So they used old molds and shit and then just kind of repainted them. They added one new figure, Bob the Goon. 
remember that dude who fucking in ba- in Batman who's like Bob Gun. Yeah, yeah. And partly responsible for the reason for the name of Silent Bob because I was like, yeah, Bob the Goon, man, Bob, good name. Bob. Oh, really? Silent I didn't know it. A little bit. All ties in, as you can see. Um, so they were unprepared toy wise. From there forward, they got prepared for Batman Returns. They had toy deals, but Batman Returns was so dark. They had this McDonald's deal to do Happy Meal toys. <laughs> but the movie was so 1992. This was considered so fucking dark that there were parental complaints of like. This vehicle. This meal is unhappy. Nothing's happy about it. This is an unhappy meal, and this penguin go- character is grotesque. This woman has a whip. She's an S and M artist, and so uh, people jumped on its dick and said it was dark and shit. But you could at least get toys out of those movies, man. These yeah, new yeah. fucking Nolan movies. He plays it so straight. Tough to get a toy out of it. Yeah. I would imagine, like, uh, it's particularly based on when you looked at Batman Begins, like, like the gear. They're like, here's the Batmobile. And you're like, that doesn't look like a Batmobile. That looks like a big tank. Yeah, and yeah. they're like, here's the Batman figure and the Scarecrow figure. And and here's the, the uh, the they didn't even call him Raza Gul. I think they call him Henry Ducard because they're trying to keep a secret. And you just had three figures and it wasn't like. Did they did actually make figures? They did. They did. And the, and the Scarecrow figure <laughs> had the bag on his head and shit. But, you know, it's cool, but you're like, I can, this ain't lighting no kid's world on fire. They're not playing with this. They like him big. That's why they came out with those other, like, kid friendly super like batman and and superman and green lantern like super buddies and shit something for the kids man because super buddies i I forget what it's called but they do like squishy fathead versions of like we're your favorite heroes (laughs) we all hang out together they all hang out in a club and shit you know it's like not like like justice babies but like little versions of the character gotcha something a little more kid friendly because you can't hand a fucking kid that scarecrow figure and be like go imagine he terrorizes people with his with drugs <laughs> it. i would just fucking put it there and just stare at it and be like what happened to you it doesn't lend itself to kind of like joker's gonna kick you in a butt batman pew 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 yeah, yeah. that age is gone but the figures man if you like the movie you're like ballsy these look fucking cool and shit but that movie itself so earnest yeah so earnest batman begins was scott that when we walked out that's all i could think was like wow like it had never occurred to me that someone would make a movie even more serious about Batman yeah. than Tim Burton. Like Tim Burton, we felt like, wow, man, he really fucking treated Batman seriously. Thank you. There was none of this biff, pow, bam, or yeah. hey, little chum, or anything like that. But then fucking Nolan came in and was just like, oh, no, this is how you treat it seriously. Yeah. yeah. And put it in the real world and fucking like, uh, you know, nothing was on a sound stage. I mean, maybe there was some interior work in a sound stage, mm-hmm. but. The exteriors and he shot like big scope. Everything looked fucking cool and real. So I remember like liking Batman Begins, but not being over the moon by it until I watched it again and again and again. And I'd be like, this is kind of cool. But I really fell in love with the hardcore after the dark night. Yeah. Now Nolan fucking outdoes himself um, and probably makes one of the greatest movies ever made. I, I called it at the point, the godfather of comic book movies. And even that's reductive. That Dark Knight movie, it's got plot holes and they're shitting it that's dopey, but oh my God, talk about a wonderful piece of cinema and talk about treating it seriously. And you never imagined anyone could outdo Jack Nicholson as the Joker and yet Heath Ledger comes in and drops his fucking psychotic science on us where you're like, oh shit, it was the you know the Joker for our generation, or not our generation, the next generation. But yep. this is just epic, man. Like He treats this movie so fucking big and he does real world stunts. He takes an 18 wheeler and flips it yeah right in the streets in chicago and you know there's it's not like hey look at all the cg shit i could do take he dials it back does old school just movie making and shoots a lot of sequences in 70 millimeters so you go see it in imax and the massive fucking use of the frame looks beautiful they put out the opening few minutes of the movie um on top of uh, i think it was uh, the, the you know the will smith movie where he's the i am legend i am legend they put the first six minutes of Dark Knight yeah, yeah. on that so you could see the bank robbery sequence where the Joker is revealed. And then they had little shots of Batman and, and throughout at the end, and then boom, it was quick. But it was astounding, and it was done. You could go see it in IMAX. It was fucking massive. But how do you fucking do a Joker where people don't go, oh, Jack Nicholson already did it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how do you? How do you? Suddenly, you look at Batman Begins is like total first act, where you're like, "Oh my god, it was yeah. just set up." This, this is what happens when your universe is in place. Everything gets changed in a good way. The fucking, you know, the Tim Burton movies and Batman Begins, 
they had this cow configuration on Batman where he could never move his head or neck. And yeah. you know, Batman's one of the world's greatest fighters, and you'd see him fight, and you'd have to turn his whole fucking body. <laughs> like, come here. He looked more like the Tin Man. Get out of my of peripheral fight. vision. If I only had a heart. <laughs> but uh, now, when, Bat- when Bruce Wayne goes to Lucius Fox, he's just like, I need a new suit. And he's like, three buttons is a little 90s, Mr. Wayne. And he's like, no, I'm talking about function over form, whatever. And he's like, oh, you want to be able to turn your head. And suddenly... In the movie, Batman has a new cow configuration, different than you've ever seen in any other Batman before, where he could turn his fucking head. And somebody just had the brilliant idea of, like, make it kind of like a motorcycle helmet, man. Just real tight to his fucking head, but it's separate from the neck, so he could fucking twist his head all the way around. Yeah, Improvements are made. Improvement to the Joker character. Improvement to uh, the mythos in general. The idea of taking this character and being like, nobody knows anything about him, man. The makeup, it's not, it's not fucking him with pale white skin and fright red hair you know green hair rather you know done to him chemically it's a dude who puts war paint on he literally puts that makeup on and the smile the rictus grin isn't like some weird chemical reaction based on a bullet physical it's well it's physical and as much as he cut his own fucking mouth open well you don't know what he did because he tells multiple versions of the story every aspect of that movie is fascinating and kind of you know even with the there's some scenes where you're like oh it's chuffo just get to the next part cartilage scenes if you will even those scenes are fucking well done it's the batman movie you always wanted to see that's what the dark knight is and then at the end and even with its you know flaws and shit and there are some people crucify if you try to point them out there's a couple and there are plot holes but even by the time you get to the end of the movie you're like fuck man this is i what what could you possibly do next, man? What could you fucking do? And we waited for a few years, and he did it. And it's called The Dark Knight Rises, and it just came out. I have seen it three times. So I saw it Thursday night at midnight, saw it Friday, and then I saw it with my kid on Saturday. I saw it Friday for spoilers. First, I saw it midnight with Muse. We went to the, all the tickets were sold out. But since we hang out at Universal a lot, you know, for spoilers and shit. We're like, hey, man, we want to go. We don't give a shit about no seats and shit. So they said, we want to go watch in a projection booth. I said, fuck, yeah. So we paid our bits, and we went up to the projection booth and started watching it from there. Beautiful view. You can see the whole thing. The speaker's in the room, so you can hear the whole fucking thing. Problem is, you're sitting right next to the biggest film projector yeah, yeah, on the yeah. planet, yeah. so you're hearing that as well. So we did the first 10, 15 minutes there, and then at one point went downstairs and stood in the back of the theater the yeah. whole movie. Now, that movie's two hours and 40 minutes. It's a lot of standing. It's a lot of standing, but I never bitched once. Never felt uncomfortable. It was never like, oh my God, like I wish I had a seat. I was fuck. it had me. I was there the whole fucking time. When I go back to see it, I have a seat so I can actually sit there and fucking enjoy it and whatnot. And then th- I, I watched it. Jen went, we watched it for spoilers. And then the third time I went back with my kid and her, and her friend. And uh, that second and third time, you know, you can soak up yeah, every yeah. little piece. First time is just immersion. Second time, you start looking for details and stuff and try to clear up things that you were confused about. And then third time, you know, you start going, this is the parts that I'm going to try to memorize. And these are the parts that when I get this deep fucking Blu-ray, this is what I'll watch over and over again. Scott hasn't seen The Dark Knight <laughs> Rises. No. So what I'll try to do is tell Scott the story of The Dark Knight Rises. Yes. Because I don't know if I mean, re- review, whatever. I, I mean, don't I watch movies anymore. I just have you tell me what they are. That's it. Mosher's giving up on movies. He's like, how'd it go? I was like, oh, it's like this. Pew, pew, pew. And then bang. And then boo. And he's like, that's good. I'm like, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds a lot like the last movie. So, um, The Dark Knight Rises, Scott, stars, as we know, Christian Bale is The Dark Knight. Uh, yep. Uh, Michael Caine is back as Alfred Pennyworth, his loyal butler. Butler, um, uh, Lucius Fox, played by Morgan Freeman. This time around, they add some new characters. Selena Kyle slash Catwoman is played by Anne Hathaway. Yeah. Uh, Bane is played by Tom Hardy. Uh, Miranda Tate is played by, uh, what's her name? Marion Cotillard. Yeah. And then there's a cop named John Blake, who's played by uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Uh, Matthew Modine's in the movie, and although he does a really good job, I have no fucking clue why. Um, he, but he's he's good, but it's just his character was kind of, that arc didn't make what, much sense. Is he, what is, he is a cop that works under Jim Gordon, and he's there periodically to comment on the fact that Jim Gordon is a very vigilant cop, even in the 
eight years of peace we've had since the end of the dark night because that's when the movie picks up eight years eight later. years later um you know he even while the, the crime stats say one thing jim gordon is still on the case and whatnot so matthew modine is meant to kind of show this is the not anti jim gordon but this is what happens when you're not Jim Gordon. You know, he's not as he's more political than anything else. And then, oh, so he's on, the new commissioner? No, that's the other thing. You know, it's just kind of like J- Jim Gordon is still the commissioner. But there's rumor at the beginning of the room, at the beginning of the movie, there's rumor that you know, in the fall, the mayor is going to dump Jim Gordon and go with a new police commissioner because it's been you know he, Matthew Modine. He even says it in the trailer. He goes, but he's a war hero, you know. And, the, and then the congressman character goes, yeah, but this is peacetime. Um, cause it's been, yeah, yeah. nothing's going on in Gotham. They keep making reference to the fact that it's so cleaned up. The mayor talks about, there's no organized crime. They, they have the dent act based on what happened with Harvey Dent. The whole movie opens on Harvey Dent day at the end of the dark night, Harvey Dent, you know, became two face and tried to kill Jim Gordon's kid, but Batman saved him. And then Batman was like, look, we got to tell the world that I did this, that I killed those cops and that I, you know, threatened your kid. And then I did this to Harvey Dent and I broke his back and broke his neck or whatever. And uh, the logic, which always seemed kind of specious to me, was that, you know, the world, the Gotham believed that Harvey was their white knight. And if they found out that Harvey was this madman who killed cops and fucking, yeah, yeah. like their spirit would break forever. The practical reason was if, if the district attorney turns out to be a fucking nut bar, everybody he put away is now up for parole. Yeah. So I think in order to keep Gotham, um, you know, in some semblance of order or whatever, the plan was quickly hatched, probably not well thought out, but quickly hatched at the end of Dark Knight where Batman was like, tell him I did this. And and that's where, you know, keep him the hero. Let Harvey beat a white knight and fucking I'm the bad guy. So when you pick up with the Dark Knight Rises, it begins eight years after. Uh, the events in the dark night and you know there's peace in gotham everyone's doing well the opening sequence but before that happens before you even get there it's the opening sequence that they we saw at the head of i forget which movies they put i think it was at the head of mission impossible four they put uh the opening eight minute sequence from the dark night rises kind of mirrored the way they put out the opening yeah. few minutes of the dark night on i am legend so you've all if if you've if you've seen that you know in the theater it, it remains exactly unchanged with the exception of the, they cleaned up the Bane voiceover, so, uh, not voiceover but his his dialogue because there were so many people bitched about the dialogue in the opening eight minute prologue when it was in theater you couldn't understand it yeah like it's muffled I can't understand what he's saying which bummed me out because he's I, covering his mouth yeah he's fucking not speaking clearly make it clear for us I I for me I felt it was cool because it made you work a little harder. Like, I was like, I'd rather that. I'd rather, like, you lose a few people going, I can't understand it, and let them fucking work for it, man, because it just sounded so badass. But, you know, it does not, it's not like it sounds bad now. They just cleaned it up so it's crystal clear, and he's turned up over everyone else. So you always fucking hear Bane's dialogue now. So if you've seen that, eight, that, that opening prologue, it's the exact same kind of, um, oh, it's fucking awesome. It is, is a really well-done sequence, and that's the introduction of the Bane character. Now, you're following the Dark Knight, and Heath Ledger gave perhaps what is the pinnacle performance of a bad guy in a movie that we'll see for the next fucking decade. He was phenomenal. The bar has been lifted really high. Tom Hardy gets there, man. Like, and I'm not going to say it's the brilliance of Tom Hardy or or it's the brilliance of the idea of Bane and the mask. It's everything put together. But I have to give credit to whoever fucking came up with the idea of doing the voice. And I got to imagine that's Tom Hardy. Because that's what makes the character for me in the movie. You have this hulking fucking brood of a man. And what do you imagine to come out of him? I would kill. I will break Batman. Yeah, yeah. Nothing. He sounds like this posh old British man. Where he's like, perhaps he's wondering why he would shoot a man before throwing him out of a plane. Like, it, it's not the voice you would expect. And because of that, it's even fucking scarier, man. Like, it's a cool choice that makes that fucking character. Yeah. I will, when this comes out on Blu-ray, I'll just sit there and watch every Bane scene. And I never imagined saying that because I didn't really like the Bane character in the comic books. So I just thought it was dopey. But Tom Hardy's voice choice and his performance and the fact you can't see his mouth is just really he gives an ocular performance. It's all in the yeah. eyes. It's fucking tits. It's, it's like this generation's Darth Vader, man. It's a guy speaking through a rebreather and he's bald like Vader was. 
and he's villainous. Uh, it's and he's true, truly villainous and strong and powerful. Like Vader could look. There are a lot of things in the Dark Knight Rises. That's what I thought. I was watching a movie going, I love this. I love this. And there are a lot of things where you're like, oh, I've seen this. I've seen this. There are a lot of familiar elements, and, yeah. and not just from the previous Batman movies. Like Bane has an overall Darth Vader kind of feel to the whole affair. Um, there's a moment in the movie that comes straight out of fucking Goodwill Hunting, where spoilers again. We're talking about this movie big time. We jump all over a fucking place. Um, at one point early in the movie, Alfred says to Bruce Wayne, he's just like, I. Uh, he's going, you know, I never wanted you to come back to Gotham because there's only heartbreak for you here, which is true. Like, I'd never thought about that. It's true. Like, Alfred probably would have been like, I hope this kid never fucking comes back yeah, because yeah. what's left for him in the city this is a city that killed his fucking parents. Yeah. And for some reason, he always wants to save Gotham, come back and save Gotham because of, in the movies, Nolan does a nice job of tying that in with his father. Like, his father was civic minded and built the trains and, all yeah. the money from the Wayne uh, enterprises went into the profits went into Wayne Foundation, which funded public works and blah blah blah. He gave a lot back, so I guess like the idea was when Bruce came back to Gotham, you know, he was well, well, really, he got defensive of Gotham because well, I guess that's what it is. Now that I put it together, in Batman Begins, he's training with the League of Shadows, um, with under who he thinks is Ra's al Ghul, with the help of Henry Ducard, who was played by Liam Neeson. Um, and then Ra's al Ghul tells him his mission is going to be to go to Gotham and bring it down. Yeah. And Bruce Wayne is like, no, what are you talking about? I don't want to do that. And they're like, it's corrupt. It must be burned down. We must destroy, ba restore balance to civilization by getting rid of this, this city. That's a fucking blight and blah, blah, yeah, blah. Yeah. And that's when he's just like, Gotham can be saved. I can, I can give me time. I can save it. And, uh, you know, the, he's put to the decision right there. And that's when he fucking like, he, he's supposed to kill a guy to like cut this fucking dude's head off he stole he broke the law yeah yeah and he's just like i I'll, i won't i can't do it. i can't kill this man i won't do that you know and he's just like well this this is true justice this is about justice like if you want justice you have to be able to do this and so faced with the decision that's i guess the pinnacle moment where he's like fuck this i can't he was going to be in the league of shadows and instead he's like i, I now i i guess that's the moment in the chris nolan movies where he suddenly becomes a fan of gotham because prior to that he leaves and he doesn't give a fuck. He tries to go shoot Joe Chill, but he doesn't get the chance because Falcone's men kill him instead. And then, like, you know, what's her face? Uh, Rachel Dawes, who was played by uh, Katie Holmes in that movie. You know, she finds out about the gun. She slaps him fucking twice. And she's like, you're a piece of shit. She don't say that. but And then. Uh, and <laughs> she should have. Yeah, she really should have. And then she does. She gives him a lot. of She gives him a hard time. She gives him a lot of guff about, about like this. How could you do this? It's like. He fucking, his parents got killed by the guy that's in the bar. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so she brings him down there and she's like, you want to fucking do something about it? There he is. He's in that bar. Go talk to him. And he goes in, uh, uh, Bruce Wayne, uh, Christian Bell, and he has a wonderful little scene with, uh, what's his name? That actor I love who's in, in the bedroom and he was in Michael. Oh, uh, Tom. Tom Wilkinson. Tom Wilkinson. He plays Falcone. And it's kind of like, again, that's a real seeding moment for the character in that, in the, in the arc of that movie because it's essentially telling him what are you going to do there's nothing you can do like i got a judge over there i got cops over here i got the mayor over there like i own this fucking town yeah and so you know they they rough him up throw him out and shit and he takes off his coat gives it to a fucking homeless dude and jumps on a steamer and then heads off and for seven years goes away and trains to become batman it's a really wonderful sequence in batman begins because yeah. they show him training like learning to be a thief before he's like i learned I learned about crime, you know, when I had to eat and he would steal an apple or something like that. But then he would go into training and, and uh, with other criminals and shit. And they show a sequence where he's like breaking into a place, but they get caught. And the, the cops are just like, uh, they're like, uh, tell you guys are fucking in trouble. And, and he goes, I didn't steal anything. Bruce Wayne goes, I didn't steal anything. And then the cop goes, tell that to the guy you stole this from. And he kicks the fucking box and it says Wayne technology on it. So even in his training, he's not breaking yeah, the yeah. law. That's what I love about Batman. He's got such an absolute moral compass. The lesson in Batman is if you are a billionaire, you can afford to be completely. Uh, you can be rigid in your moral stance. Such a rigid moral code, which in our world is not the case. The richer one gets, the less moral one seems to become. Not in all cases, but you know, you hear about fucking 
everything that just happened to our economy in the last fucking few years all yeah. collapsed because a bunch of greedy motherfuckers wanted more money and shit. None of them are putting on masks and going out and beating up bad people, Scott. So at the end of the day, Bruce Wayne, Batman, you got yourself a moral example of a billionaire. That's that's once again, it's fiction, you know, and it doesn't really right then and there. You should be able to divorce yourself from reality and be like, this is impossible. This is impossible because no billionaire would ever fucking <laughs> waste their time helping others because you wouldn't main. And they they kind of touch that in the movie. Like if you're not watching your money, it'll go away. Like at one point in the flick, he loses all his money. In which one? In the new one. In the, in the new Dark one. Knight Rises, part of the plot. Well, they make him lose his money. Like you know, it's part of the part of the breaking of the bat, if you will. Gotcha. So Alfred has a moment early in the movie where you know he goes. Um, when you were, I didn't want you to come back to Gotham. In fact, once a year, I would take, while you were gone, I would take a vacation, only one vacation. I'd go to this cafe somewhere in Europe and stuff, Italy or France, I forget. <clears throat> and I would sit down and I'd have this drink, fancy pants drink, Scott, not like a Yulu or something like that. Like a or something. Yeah, like that. yeah. In one of those tiny glasses where you'd be like, that, how's that going to say it any thirst whatsoever? Rich people drinks. <laughs> so he'd be like, I'd be sitting here having this drink and I'd, I'd look over size of a tangerine <laughs> i'd look over and i'd see you and he'd see uh bruce, he'd, essentially he'd see bruce and they wouldn't talk um they wouldn't have to but he would just know that he would be happy he's like i'd see you with a wife or maybe some kids and i'd know that you were happy and that would be enough like if he'd never come back to gotham when he left when he jumped on the steamer if alfred had come across him in life and seen him he wouldn't go bother him or harass me he wouldn't need to talk to him he would just be he, he would, would let him he would be happy that he has that life and yes go. i'm gonna start crying um he would so at the spoilers dude and again we're jumping all over at the end of the movie and this is a big time fucking spoiler so the very you, very end if you movie. haven't seen the dark knight rises stop listening and don't listen to the rest until you do unless you're me <laughs> Yeah, Scott. I asked Scott. He's like, I don't care. Like, I was like, Scott, you sure you want this spoiled for you? He was looking at me like I was like, Scott, you sure you want to breathe air? <laughs> he was just like, of course, dude. I don't care. Um, okay, so big time spoilers. A lot of people have uh, theorized online that Batman was going to die. You see the trailers, and you know, yeah. this, this Catwoman's just like, you don't owe these people anything. You know, you've given them everything, and and he's like, not everything. Not yet. And you're like, oh my God, Nolan's going to do the impossible. He's literally going to crucify Batman for our sins. Yeah. Like, oh my, nobody's ever thought about this. Nobody's ever thought about fucking killing Batman. Even in the Dark Knight, the, the seminal Frank Miller work, Dark Knight Returns. Um, you know, Batman gets killed and he's in the grave and they're at the grave and Clark is there, Clark Kent slash Superman. And he's about to walk away and all of a sudden he hears boom, boom, one heartbeat and he looks at I'm gonna cry about that too. Such a beautiful <laughs> moment in that book. And he looks at Carrie Kelly, who's the new Robin, and she looks fucking caught, where she's like, "Holy shit!" Like Superman just busted me. And then he rocks a little fucking, um, what's his name? Uh, the artist Kurt Swan, Superman with the smile and the fucking spit curl, kind of winks. Yeah, lets her know that like, all right, I know he's alive, but nobody say anything. Yeah. And then you know, at the end of the book, you see him building a new army of batman kids yeah, yeah. and shit like that such a great book so in any event even the great frank miller didn't kill batman you can't kill batman no who would dare and then for a moment we're all like chris nolan's gonna fucking kill batman and when you're watching the movie i'll be honest with you when he fucking gets to that beat i was okay with it <laughs> that sounds so stupid <laughs> this guy's looking at me like you need help <laughs> It was beautiful, dude. If you're a Batman, when they fan, get to the moment in the movie where you, I'll say this: think I've seen a lot of people on Twitter talking about like I cried in the last ten minutes, so I'm not going to be ashamed of fucking crying here. But there's, <laughs> which is not the last ten minutes of the movie. I know. And ironically, I didn't even cry in the movie itself. But in reflecting on it, it's pretty damn beautiful. So the three times you saw it, yes, you didn't cry. At First time I got a little glassy. Uh, but I was more like I've fucking been standing for two hours. <laughs> I was like, my legs hurt. I, I can't feel my legs. Batman, save me! <laughs> I my eyes were glassy, but I was also more fucking thunderstruck that he was doing what he was doing because I was like, wow, this this never occurred to me as the way that Batman would die. Spoilers, dude, and I'm not ranking on it, but this is the second movie this summer about a guy in a mask, a superhero who's a billionaire in real life, 
the third act of the movie is predicated on that billionaire removing a nuclear weapon from a city. Like, I'm not saying, like, well, I got Nolan copied Avengers. Obviously not. They were working at the same time. <laughs> I literally haven't seen the Avengers either, so I didn't know what you're talking about. <laughs> As you can see, the most appropriate choice <laughs> to speak to about movies is going to be Scott Logan. At the end of Avengers, spoilers, uh, Tony Stark, Iron Man, yeah. takes a nuclear type device out away from Earth to a different fucking dimension and lets it go there. Dimension? And f- yeah. And you got to see the movie. And honestly, like, you. you when if as i hear myself say it i'm like it's dopey but it works in the movie yeah, the only yeah. thing i got complained about in that movie is the fucking loki pokey stick loki has yeah a stick i remember where, you talking about oh, being really mad about it come on dude touch a heart and you're like you're a bad guy it's like such a five-year-old thing to do on the playground like bang you're it you're a bad guy but then people go like hey man if you're fucking all for the infinity gauntlet because at the end of avengers spoilers there's a little tease of thanos yeah i saw i've heard that so if they're like if you're all about it, and i was like oh fuck we're gonna see the infinity gauntlet man and they're like if you like the fucking infinity gauntlet then you gotta like the loki pokey stick because there's the mind gem from the infinity gauntlet and that's why he can make people fucking into bad guys so they got me on a technicality loki pokey stick seemed <laughs> very they? <laughs> you know the people that run my life Scott, <laughs> the anonymous folks of the internet <laughs> they almost got me but i moved to the left <laughs> i was almost free scott but they've got me um so that so the movie ends. I mean, again, spoilers, and we're gonna jump around. The movie ends with Batman having to take this nuclear device, use his new bat wing type device, which they just call the bat the plane. plane you've seen in the yeah. trailers, away from Gotham out to sea. You know, because the bomb has a blast radius of six miles. And there's a wonderful shot where he's fucking going, and, and he, he ain't gonna make it because the bat the bat doesn't have autopilot. And there's a running thing throughout the movie where Lucius Fox is like, I can't get the autopilot to work. Um, Andy Dufresne crawled through a rubber. I'm going to say shoot. this five times, and I don't know if it's going to come up later. <laughs> I know. And it's woven in in such a way where you're like, boy, somebody better fix that autopilot. They keep mentioning this it. This like, autopilot seems really important. <laughs> and he says, like, at one point, he's just like, you know, you're going to have to do it, Mr. Wayne. And then later on, there's a beat where he's just like, uh, <coughs> you know, how's it fly? And Bruce Wayne's like, pretty good, man. But, uh, you know, I can't get the autopilot. Wish there was an autopilot. Pretty much. So at the end of the Bet movie. that come in handy. At the end of the movie, he hooks up the fucking bomb that he's got to get out of Gotham, which is unstoppable time bomb, um, uh, which to me has shades. There are shades of every Batman incarnation in this movie, including the Adam West Batman, because it reminds you when he's running down with the dock, docks with the bomb with a time bomb, <laughs> dude. Swear. So he hooks up the bomb and he's carrying it out of the city. On on, the, on his uh, bat wing. Before he hooks it up, though, you know he says, uh, "No autopilot." Somebody says something about like, "Hey man, you can take it out." And <laughs> hey, why don't you use the autopilot? Yeah, he's like, <laughs> <laughs> "Why didn't I listen?" Everyone, Lucius said it like five times over the course of the last two weeks. Um, he, the autopilot's not fixed, so you're like, if he's going out, he's going out. He's taking this thing out uh, to see this nuclear weapon. And you see him go out to sea and you see the fucking bomb go off. And, you know, you don't before you see that, there's a shot of him in the bat in the bat. And again, fucking spoilers, man. You can you cannot be mad at me if I'm going to go into deep detail on this movie. You've been warned many, many times. Spoilers up the ass. Yeah. There's a shot where he's in the bat and they cut to Christian Bale. And it's really quite beautiful. And they're playing this kind of like you know music the score goes away to more of an acapella choral thing of heaven this motherfucker gonna die music that you're <laughs> kind of familiar with look and i will say right now the best feature of this movie right up there shoulder to shoulder with tom hardy maybe even a little better than tom hardy is hans zimmer score it is fucking relentless it is a fantastic score that just never fucking stops and key it's the heartbeat of the movie it is really really fucking good anyway he got some kind of like, ah, you know, like he's going to die kind of the uh, kid solo Q. woman's cue singing, whatever. <clears throat> and they cut to him. He's in the, you know, the front of the ship flying. And he just has this look on his face of like, all right, like contentment. Like yeah. fucking. He's ready. Yeah, yeah. Because there's lots of talk throughout the movie, Scott, of like, he's got a death wish. Like Alfred spoilers leaves him because he's like. I can't, I'm not going to watch you do this. He's like, you're not Batman because he hasn't been Batman for so many years at that point. So I think they more got rid of Alfred because he would have been like human bait. Like, what do you do with him all throughout that storyline? Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, just from a story point of view. 
because he would have weakened Batman. And plus, with everything that's going on, they would have killed Alfred as well. Yeah. And yeah, there's a, good, a lot of good reasons to get rid of Alfred plot-wise. But he leaves at a certain point. So there's, there's uh, Batman. Uh, anyway, I won't, he, he, Alfred's talking to him throughout the movie a couple times, accusing him of having a death wish and shit. And like, I'm afraid, you know, uh, Bruce Wayne's like, what are you afraid I can't beat him? And he's like, I'm afraid you don't want to. You know, he's like, are you afraid I'm not going to come back? He's like, I'm afraid you don't want to come back. He's like, you've just been sitting around for seven, eight years just waiting for shit to go bad. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so in that moment, you know, and then also throughout the movie, like he gets spoilers, he gets his back broken and shit, and he has to rebuild himself. So, you know, the, he appreciates life a bit more. And they also, you know, lesson he learns in the, in the fucking place where he's rehabilitating the jail that Bane throws him into the hole in the earth. <clears throat> the old wise man next to him has been a prisoner for 50 years is, you know, like you must be afraid how could you not be afraid? You cannot go further and fight. You cannot go faster if there is not fear of death. And so, you know, he teaches him to be afraid of death again, and that gives him the extra oomph he needs to. Because if you're not afraid of death, the, the philosophy is like, what do you give a shit? Like, first thing he says to Bane after he's broken when he wakes up, he says, why didn't you kill me? So that's a dude who's clearly like, you know, I was okay with, you didn't yeah, have to yeah. keep me alive. You know, I mean, like I fought my hardest and shit and whatever. But he learns to fucking want life again and shit and not have a death wish. So in this moment where he's taking the nuclear weapon out over to sea, taking it away from Gotham to save his city, ultimately do what he's been trying to do for all three fucking movies. <laughs> he has this peace on his face that's not like, yeah, I can't wait to die. Fuck this world. But just like, all right, this makes sense. Like this is, this is what I, I, my whole life was committed to saving Gotham. And this is the only way I could do it. And as previously mentioned, the autopilot doesn't really work on this vehicle. So, <laughs> so I guess this is the end yeah. for Batman. Yeah. And then you see the blast and then, you know, it's fucking, then you hear the eulogy and fucking Jim Gordon is reading about, you know, the Batman at the grave of Batman. He's reading a, 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 sounds like a piece from Tale of Two Cities. Far, far greater thing than I've ever done. A far, far greater rest that I go to than I've ever had. I believe that's from Tale of Two Cities. It sounds Dickensian. I'm not sure. Should have looked it up. But Alfred comes back and he's at the grave and there's Bruce Wayne's grave and it's right on the Wayne Manor estate. Jim Gordon's there. Lucius Fox, this new cop who, you know, uh, John Blake just gets introduced in this movie and somehow this motherfucker's allowed to go to the fucking funeral. <laughs> I, that bugged me. Um, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and then Alfred, Alfred's come back. <laughs> little things like that. Alfred's sitting there. Everyone walks away after Jim Gordon reads the uh, eulogy and Alfred's crying at his, the parents' grave going like, I failed you. Like, you, you know, essentially you left me your kid and I failed you. He's laying here next to you. Can't keep a fucking Wayne alive yeah. if you're Alfred Pennyworth. <laughs> so he's a lot. I think so. <laughs> it's like Alf can't get a break, bitches. Right? He's what leaning on a fuck? grave, emptying his fucking porn of forty on their graves. This is for the Waynes. <laughs> Drain my Wayne, right? Sorry, I couldn't keep him alive. This is last twenty minutes. I tried. <laughs> in honor of like Chris Nolan was like in honor of uh, you know the great Michael Caine. Uh, he asked <laughs> that he could improv ad lib this scene, and so. You know, he's a legend and he's getting up there in years. We're just going to leave the whole thing in. It's 20 minutes of him just fucking ad lib and shit. He sings at one point. Swanee! <laughs> Chris Swanee Nolan's River. Like, <laughs> oh, I love you. Oh, I love you. Chris Nolan's like, oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. That's a promise. I wish I could take that. <laughs> it's like, I mean, I said I'd leave it in, but it wasn't like one of these vows that say Bruce Wayne made it his parents' grave. They're like, you don't always have to refer. Batman, yeah. dude. He's like, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Fucking, I'm a billionaire. As a Batman. <laughs> <laughs> People like Fat Cam Smith talking about Batman. He ain't making a dime. Batman <laughs> fucking made me rich. <laughs> um. So anyway, Alfred, you know, talks about if I'd ever seen you at the cafe, I'd be. I I wouldn't even yeah, say yeah. a word. I'd be happy. So after the death and after the funeral, they're doing wrap up beats and shit like that. And Alfred's wrap up beat. And the score is playing underneath the Hans Zimmer, and it's a driving score because you're like, why are they? What are they driving towards, Scott? Because the autopilot was clearly <laughs> yeah, broken. It was clearly broken. Where could they be going with this? 
So as it's driving, you know, <laughs> somebody like beat the shit out of Lucius Fox. <laughs> yeah, like piece of shit. <laughs> if only you'd put a little more time into yeah. the autopilot. <laughs> Work harder, huh? I'm a little. He like, trusted yeah. you and put you in charge. Um, they uh, there is a Lucius Fox <laughs> moment, Scott. <laughs> He's just like I'm not kidding. That ironically involves the autopilot. His moment <clears throat> is him talking to the uh, some technicians in in the. Uh, 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 armory, we, you know the the, the division of Wayne where Enterprises build. off the record. You know yeah, where yeah. the research but, and development R and D wing or whatever. So some guys are working on a similar bat because clearly it couldn't be the bat wing the Batman was in because that was obliterated in a nuclear blast. But he's going over the this technicians are going over the tech and uh, you know Lucius is like, can you please check it again? I just want to know what I could have done different. You know, he's bereft. He's sad. And then one of the technician goes, but that's the thing, Mr. Fox. He's going, it has a patch going back a, f- a few months. Um, it's fixed. Like the autopilot does work on these. And he goes, what's the name on the patch? What do you think the name on the patch is, Scott? Who did the patch? It's a technical thing. Like, you know, with computers and shit. Yeah, yeah. Fucking Bruce Wayne. So right then and there, I, I didn't want to let you guess because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I was so excited. <laughs> so right then and there, you're like, oh, shit. Oh, shit, Scott. Maybe the autopilot wasn't broken <laughs> after all. And then the next shot you see is Alfred sitting at that same cafe that he flashed back to when he was telling Bruce, like, you know, I go there and I have this fancy drink and I'd imagine seeing you. And if I saw you with your wife or your kids or whatever, yeah, you know, yeah. I wouldn't need to go talk to you. I would just. Mm-hmm. smile and i know that you were happy alfred says i'm gonna cry again alfred sits down <laughs> in the in the cafe scott this is this is such a beautiful moment that like it erases makes up for anything else that i got issues with there are two moments in this movie where i'm like thank you you that is fucking beautiful this is one of them alfred's sitting down in the cafe and again i love this moment so much that i'm not even gonna make a you know be like this is the moment from goodwill hunting like, yeah, yeah. This is a good. This is the Goodwill Hunting moment. If you've never seen Goodwill Hunting, there's a moment where Ben Affleck is talking to Matt Damon's character, and he goes, uh, "They're at the quarry at a at, a, at a, a job site." Yeah, and he talks about, you know, what my my favorite part of my day is the best few minutes of my day. He's like, when I'm walking up to your apartment, and I knock on the door. He's gone and for for a second, and you don't answer. I think maybe he just got the hell out of here. Maybe he's just gone, man. And I'm so happy. He's gone, but then you you come out and we go to work and everything's fine. But for that one brief moment, I just I'm happy because I think you got the fuck out of here. I think you got away. I think you made something better in your life. That moment when I'm reading the Goodwill Hunting script, that's what makes me cry in the toilet. I talk about like you know when we brought that script into Miramax. Yeah. I was reading it in the toilet. I came out of the toilet after two hours. Turned to Scott. And I was like, I'm crying. I was like, You got to read this. <laughs> I just pooped. <laughs> <laughs> What happened in there, Scott? <laughs> Things came out of me. Scott's like, you never pooped before? Yeah, what would you think of the script? <laughs> <laughs> so I come out and I'm like, what, the moment that touched me the most is that's set up in the script, you know, where uh, Ben says that, Chucky says that to Will. And then at the end of the movie, Will hunting leaves. He never says goodbye to his friends. And they show, you know, uh, Sean is like, uh, he tells him a story about missing the fucking famous game, the Red Sox with yeah. Pudge caught or blah 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 the ball and uh he goes but i wasn't there he goes why not he's going because i went to i went to i went to see about a girl this yeah, woman yeah. he was in love with who became his wife so sean comes out and opens his mailbox and and sees the letter and it's from will and it says i've gone to see about a girl and uh you know robin williams has a really nice moment where he's like son of a bitch stole my line yeah. and he walks in the house <laughs> really beautiful moment and then the next thing you see is or is either before that right near that was my favorite moment in that script and it was the one that made me call up harvey weinstein and, and and john gordon and be like you have to buy this movie as a screenplay chucky goes to pick up will as we've seen him do a few times in the movie yeah. he goes to his house and he knocks on the door <laughs> here we go <laughs> <laughs> it's so touching to me knocks on the door he doesn't come out and for a minute it's Probably my favorite performance of Ben Affleck's in the world. And that includes movies that I've made. He has this look on his face where he's so sad, so crestfallen. Like he's like, my friend is gone. 
But then he smiles and he heads back to the car and he just goes back to life. He's like, it's not here. I don't know where he is. And boom, it's gone. It is fucking gorgeous. It is one of the most beautiful moments in cinema history. And as I remember when we saw the movie, when we went to see Goodwill Hunting, that was the only thing I cared about. I was like, if he nails that moment, like if he nails that moment in the movie, like yeah, he did, yeah. like the boys did in the script, this movie's going to make fucking a billion dollars. It didn't, but it did make a lot. <laughs> made a hundred million, but it wasn't a billion. But I remember we, me and Scott were sitting there at the Rebecca screening room watching that first screening of Goodwill Hunting. Yeah, yeah. And that moment happens and Gus Van Sant fucking nailed it. And Ben's performance is perfect. Pitch perfect. Why did we doubt it? That was the guy who wrote that moment. Yeah, so yeah. of course it was going to play insanely well. But then Casey, but then it's like, that's when Casey's like runs in to sit in his seat, oh! which kind of like, but that wasn't in the script, but that's a Casey <laughs> Affleck thing. Casey's very smart, really fucking talented motherfucker. Um, he throws this incredible face on where he's like, ah, yeah, like he's I've got front. <laughs> he's like, I got shotgun. Um, and then you get the idea that life goes on. They're going to go on without will who's yeah, a yeah. center of their fucking lives. So this moment is a mirror of that moment. I'm not going, he fucking ripped it off. I'm just saying it's, it's a mirror of that moment. Alfred has set us up in, early in the movie going, if I'm in this cafe, I, I, this is my dream. This is my dream. So there we are at the end of the movie, dude. And I, I'm delighted because I'm, this is where I get emotional. Cause it was like, I can't believe, I can't believe I forgot. Cause I remember when he said it up front, I was like, oh, this is going to get paid off. But he does. Nolan does so much and throws so much at you throughout the movie You've forgotten. Completely misplaced it. But then when you see him in the cafe, I'm like, no, no. Oh, this is going to be amazing. And he sits down and it's the replay of the thing he talked about earlier in the movie. And then finally he locks eyes. And Michael Caine is an amazing actor. Yeah. So his performance (laughs) says it all. And what his performance in his face, Scott, what it says is the size. No, I was laughing because you're like, he's an amazing performer. I just flash back to him singing Swanee River. (laughs) Swanee. That's where the 20 minutes begins. He conveys it on his face. And the score, of course, is behind him. And what he conveys on his face literally could have been enough. You could have went to credits right there because you were like, you didn't need to cut to what he saw. Because you they know did. what he saw. You know what, they, what he saw. But he does. He cuts to what he saw. And I'll be honest with you. I was not unhappy about that. It was wholly satisfying. He could have he left it the other way. That was more like the end. Of, remember the end of Monsters, Inc.? Where so, I'm going to cry if I talk about this. Sully opens the door. <laughs> <laughs> I get an old lady about movies. I get, I get like my mom about movies. Sully opens the door and you see his face light up and you hear the voice of Boo. Yeah. That you could have done that. See, you're getting classy. <laughs> it's fucking that's a powerful moment because the yeah, relationship yeah. between Sully and, and Boo in that movie is beautiful. Just absolutely beautiful. So his face lights up. You know, Pixar, the geniuses of Pixar, can light up a motherfucker yeah. and make them look happy. That's what they do best. All those characters generally, <laughs> Scott, seem happy, except when they're racing toward flames and about to die in fucking Toy Story 3. <laughs> and even then, they seem resolute. They all hold hands and shit. <laughs> I'm going to cry again. <laughs> the end of every movie. <laughs> can't stop crying. It's the weed, Scott. It's got to be the weed, man. Um, in any event, Kane is not a Pixar character, Scott, <laughs> as you know. I know. His, but his ability as a performer to light up, to convey what, what's on the, what he's looking at sells it. You immediately know, holy shit, he's, he's alive. But you could have went to credits and had it a little more artsy and been like, you know, left it for anybody. It, yeah. His look could say to you that Bruce Wayne is still alive. Or you're like, well, if they don't show him Bruce Wayne, it could go either way because he was involved in a fucking nuclear blast. But wait again, we, we did hear that the autopilot got <laughs> somehow. But he cuts to him, and it's a shot of Bruce Wayne, and he's sitting with, again, spoilers, man. If you're this deep and you're not, you're still fucking listening yeah, and yeah. seeing the movie, shame on you. Uh, he's sitting there with Selena Kyle, who throughout the movie, she wants to get away. She wants to start over. Her whole arc is about trying to find this technology that would pull her off the grid so she can get a clean start and shit because she's got a record and blah 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 gotcha. master jewel thief and other things they alluded other things she says something like i did i've i you know at a young age i did what i had to and when you do what you have to they'll never let you do what you want to 
which I really tried to pull that apart many times going like, is that true? And I guess <laughs> <laughs> I think about these things a little too hard. I thought about the other movie too, like in Dark Knight. I remember when I saw the trailer, I got into a back and forth with it with people on Twitter. The line that always bugged me was, uh, you either die a hero or you see yourself live long enough to become the villain. And I, that always bugged me because I'm like, well, they got Harvey Dent saying it. And we all know that Harvey Dent is going to become the villain. So that seems a yeah, little yeah. on the nose. But it is actually a pretty good line. You know, it's in reference to, they talk, they reference Caesar in the scene about yeah. like how he went from being a hero to living long enough to become a villain. So I, I remember being caught up on that, on that line a little bit. Um, and this movie, I was caught up a little bit on the line. Well, it's her line. line again? Which one? Oh, she goes, once you've done what you've had to do, they'll never let you do what you want to do. And I'm not saying that like all the dialogue's got to be fantastic. It is like a Batman movie. I mean, there are moments like it's this movie another, again. This well, I'm all thumbs up on this movie. I'm a big yeah, fan. Yeah. But I, I'll, I'll tell you the little things that like it's both my lines. Dick. Both lines are sweeping generalizations to say that no person has ever fucking stayed a hero. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, I guess. <laughs> fucking Alan Shepard. And I get lost on that. <laughs> I get lost. I, I hit it like a speed bump or suddenly I'm not paying attention to the movie because I'm going like, is there truth in this? <laughs> like turning away with my hand and my, in my, my face in my hand, my fingers on is my that chin. True? Like the thinker going like, is this truth? Um, but she uh, wants to get away and she eventually gets away too <laughs> with him. They don't like cut to her where she looks around and turns and sees him and shit. She's just there in the foreground, but soft a little bit because we're tight on Christian Bale, Bruce Wayne. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you. I, I, as much as you could have ended on Alfred, the fact that Bruce Wayne like is sitting there smiling, I swear to God, I get emotional about it. I'm like, finally, somebody gave this motherfucker a happy ending. This guy's just sitting. <laughs> <laughs> somebody took him to a time massage parlor. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's always ill for this dude. Every movie ends with like, uh, if shit goes wrong again, I guess I'll yeah. come back. Here's a big spotlight. <laughs> but I don't know if you guys realize this, but I did lose my parents. <laughs> yeah. I'm very sad. So please limit the amount of uh, time that you use me. When I'm not Batman, I'm sad, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm really, I'm blubbery, man. I'll be honest with you. I don't cry more than Fat Kev Smith, but I got a reason to cry. My if parents you can believe that. <laughs> <laughs> so I got real fucking emotional thinking about it because I'm like, finally, this dude gets a break. Like, the way they end it, he don't ever have to come back. He yeah, can yeah. go live his life. He saved the city. Like, really, those three movies kind of become about Bruce Wayne trying to save Gotham primarily from fucking the League of Shadows. You know, I mean, in the middle, the Joker tries to take everything down. But um, it, it's, it's bookended by Ra's al Ghul. Um, it's and, bookended by. So he's, he's, he comes back. Like, but, but again, spoilers, fuck, I'm tired of saying spoilers, man. You just got to, well, if you're going to, how are you going to talk about the movie without talking about the movie? Absolutely. Well, some people want you to be general. Like you could talk about it without going to detail. So fuck Batman that. is in a city. Yeah. I'm like, so Batman wins. <laughs> uh, what do you think of that, Scott? You're like, well, predictables. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's in it. Liam Neeson appears as a vision to Bruce Wayne when he's recuperating from being getting the gotcha. shit beat on by Bane. And so you're so so Bane is part of the League of Shadows. Gotcha. Um, Does Bane inflate? No. That's the other thing. They don't do the version of Bane in the comics. Bane is hopped up on venom and he can like slap this thing on his chest and he gets more venom in his system so he gets roided out. It's like a super steroid and yep. shit. In this version of the story, Bane wears this mask which apparently uh, masks or or lessons whatever pain he received from he was a victim of a what sounds a little bit like not leprosy but there was a plague in the prison and then he was sh torn apart by fucking other prisoners when they were trying to get at uh this this other person so he this other person young a young prisoner um so the intimation is they tore his fucking face apart and under the mask the mask holds him together and dulls the pain because when batman finally i don't know why it fucking figured it took him this long to figure it out when batman finally starts attacking motherfuckers face piece and loosens like these things that look like they have gas in them or something like that you could see he start getting hit so the idea they never say it but the oh, idea he's sort is of like numb to pain yes like you just can't feel yes that's the idea that i got now they don't say that and it's never fucking clarified but 
It's inferred. What's in, what I got out of it is because of this fucking juice. I mean, he, number one, he's just a big dude anyway. He's pretty strong. And he's been trained just like Bruce by the League of Shadows. Like at one point, he's like, both members of the League of Shadows while they're fighting. He's so fucking good in the fight scene. It's nuts. And the fight scene is played without score. So it's just brutal. Um, but he, the intimation, I think, is that this mask is constantly, not making him high, but it's, it's like a morphine of something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So because Batman's punching the fuck out of him in his face and he barely kind of shows any reaction so that would work for me if they're like not only is the mass dull as pain it makes him kind of like he don't even fucking feel pain yeah add to it he's also very strong and powerful and kick anybody's ass so his uh his his mask thing is really fucking reminiscent of star wars of darth vader yeah that moment with alfred is very reminiscent of that uh, of uh goodwill hunting moment yeah and I'll be honest with you, and, and this is not a knock whatsoever, but the overall plot of Batman and Bane is very reminiscent of another third movie in a trilogy, Rocky Three, because there's a story about Batman. Mr. T? Bane is Clubber Lang, kind of. Like, B- Batman has not been Batman for a while, and he's gotten a little soft, you know, and when he finally gets back in the game, he's not nearly ready, and and. Michael Caine, Alfred is kind of like a Mickey character going like, you can't win against this guy, Rock. You know, he's looking at video of him going, look at the ferocity. Look, at you can't meet this man. You're no longer the Batman. Like this guy, he's working off special sauce that you ain't got. And, you know, Christian Bale, Bruce Wayne is just like, you know, I, I've, you don't think I could do it? I've saved the city before, you know. I beat Ra's al Ghul. I could beat this guy. A little too confident. Faces Bane gets beat the fuck out of. You yeah. know, wonderful sequence. I'm not, again, not a Bane fan, and I wasn't even one of these guys going, I hope the Bane breaks the bat in this movie. A lot of people online were like, he better fucking break Batman's bat like Bane did in the comics. I didn't care. I was like, yeah, I'm, yeah. and I'm not like, I'm not looking forward to the fight scene. I don't give a shit about that. I like Batman, but I, Bane is not my thing. Tom Hardy, Chris Nolan made Bane my thing, at least this version of Bane. The fight scene with them uh, is is spectacular. And it's just a series of dudes beating the shit out of each yeah, other. Yeah. Or one dude beating the sh- trying to beat the shit out of another dude, another dude taking it and then just fucking killing the other guy. And then he does break, spoilers, he breaks his fucking back. I can't tell you, dude. I wasn't looking forward to that. I didn't even like that in the comics when they did it in the Nightfall storyline and shit. They did it so well in the movie. I was like, this is fantastic. Like, this is, fa- I can't believe I wasn't looking forward to this. What else is to look forward to other than fucking Batman? fighting bane and they do it and they do it well and it's fucking tight man and the brutal again no score it's stark it play that sequence plays like a fucking indie film first fight uh the first fight second fight is something out of a movie because it's them surrounded by thousands of cops and thousands of uh bane's army fist fighting first there's some guns and then for some reason everyone's fist fighting in the in the streets um and on the steps of I don't know what that is, the courthouse or something like that. But what's cool about that sequence is there's some flurries going on. There's just a man. It just looks like Lawrence of Arabia. There's just bodies everywhere. It looks like Gandhi. It doesn't look like the days of CG, like, you know, like Lord of the Rings, where if you look very closely, you could be like, I don't think all these people are really people. They might be video iterations of one another or, you know, computer graphic. This is clearly hundreds of fucking thousands of people yeah fighting and they're using real extras and shit like that and in the midst of that you see batman and bane looking for each other like through the smoke and fucking like hitting people when they have to but just trying to get to one another such a badass moment except in the dialogue afterwards leaves a little bit desired like bane goes oh you've returned to die with your city and batman goes no he goes so you came back to die with your city and batman goes no I came back to stop you. Come on, dude. Like, I'm not saying like, just one more draft. Like, be, Batman's way more clever than that. In fact, no line is necessary. Yeah, yeah. Just, so you came back to die with your city. Punch that fucker in the mouth and go. Yeah. You don't need a fucking line there. But these are quibbles. Believe me, I'm not going like, and because of this, the movie is, no, the movie's wonderful. Everyone should go out and see it in a theater. Uh, if you can see it in IMAX, it's fucking massive on the big screen. So when I talk about this, I'm talking about quibbles. But anyway, he fights Bane, loses, just like Rocky lost to Clubber Lang. 
Then Rocky got to retrain Scott the whole movie. He's training yeah. with with uh, uh, what Carl Lewis? No, not Carl. Yeah, Carl, Carl Weathers. Carl Weathers. Carl Lewis. <laughs> he's training with Olympian <laughs> Carl Lewis. Scott. <laughs> Nineteen eighty four. He uh, he's training with uh, with uh, Apollo Creed. Yeah. And even in the Apollo Creed training montage, there's multiple attempts at racing down the beach. You know, first time Rocky and, yeah. and Apollo are racing down the beach because it's tough to run on sand, as they taught us in Rocky Three. I don't know, because why would you ever run on sand, a fat man asked. Um, I guess for health purposes. They're racing. He can't win. They see him again, race him, getting closer, doesn't quite win. By the end of the montage, Scott, you better believe that Rocky laps Apollo Creed yeah, and then yeah. he's jumping around in the water and fucking, I did it, and everyone's going crazy yeah. and shit. In this movie, it's three attempts to get out of the jail. After the Bane, after Bane breaks Batman's back, he goes out and some shit happens. But then the next time we pick up his storyline, Bruce Wayne, he's being dropped into the same pit that Bane grew up in in some other country. Um, they, uh, it's a pit that like you can't get out of. It's a, a hole, looks like a giant well, similar to the well that he fell down when he was a kid. Um, but very big mouth, very wide mouth. And the prison is down below. So this prison is horrible. The worst place on earth, Scott, because it creates despair because it gives people hope every day. They look up and they're like, I wonder if I can get out of that fucking, if I could just climb up, I'm out. That's yeah, it. Yeah. Like, there are no guards or anything like that. <clears throat> so the fact that it, their people have hope makes them even more fucking uh, sad when fucking they can't do anything because there's a little bit of hope. If you take all hope away, there's always sad, but with a little bit of hope, and you crush that hope, it's even worse, so forth and so forth. Yeah. So he's got to try to get out of this jail. First, he's got to fix his back, which is another thing I got a little issue with. Uh, we pick up the story eight years after The Dark Knight, and Bruce Wayne has a limp. He's walking with a cane. Uh, he's got a bum leg, apparently from the fall that he took with Harvey Dent at the end of The Dark Knight. So eight years later, this dude's still walking with a limp. After, you know, whatever uh, yeah, yeah. happened. And you know, dude's got billions of dollars, so yeah, obviously. Get a new leg. But he doesn't, so it must be some permanent damage. Well, when he decides to become Batman again, he puts on this electronic high-tech leg brace, Scott, that makes him walk normal again. Gotcha. And makes him be able to kick walls and break bricks and shit like that. So, eight years, <clears throat> you, you, you're kind of limping. One day, you finally put on the leg brace. Everything totally copacetic. Then someone breaks your back in yeah, battle. Yeah, throws you in a well. Throws you in a fucking well. And within two months, three months, four months max, he was able to recuperate. And the limp ain't even there. Even though he's in jail, even though he's in this jail, he doesn't have his electronic fucking magic knee brace on anymore. The knee, the leg somehow healed itself because, you know, the back is what's Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, we got to take, take little leaps of. Yeah of belief, you know, in certain areas and whatnot. But, uh, I don't think, but I honestly didn't feel like the limp was necessary. Yeah. Like yeah. I'm watching the whole first section of the movie. And again, I've seen it three times. I'm like, it's eight years later, man. You literally didn't have to do the, the limp at all. Um, I didn't know what benefit there was to it. There was a cool scene though, with a doctor where the doctor just lists his maladies. You can probably see it in one of the TV spots. I think it's in TV spot 12 and it's, uh, I think the dude's name is Thomas Lennon. Dude who's from, uh, Reno 911. And he's just going up. He's putting up an x-ray. And he's just like, well, I've seen worse cartilage in legs and knees. And Bruce Wayne's like, is that good? And he goes, no, that's bad. There's no cartilage in yours. It's bone on bone. And he starts listing all these maladies. You have constant concussive behavior in your brain and bruised kidneys and blah, blah, blah. And he's going, based on this, I cannot recommend that you go hella skiing this weekend, Mr. Wayne. And then he leaves. Uh, so there's de like they, they play the fact that Students beat the fuck up, man, yeah. in a big, bad way. Um, it, and then he goes to visit Jim Gordon in jail because Jim Gordon was attacked by Bane's army and shit. So it just it seemed weird. Like, there was no good reason for him to have that limp still. And because it just seems like, as a storyteller, you got the limp, and then you magically take the limp away with, you know, I'll go with you with the magic leg brace. Yeah. But then when you're in the prison, you ain't got no magic leg brace. You know, you got a broken back. But somehow... The back can heal, and the fucking leg goes back. You know, a little shit like that, whatever. But again, ain't gonna fucking ruin the movie. It's just one of those logic things. Yeah, tiny. Um, the third act, of course, he comes back and beats a shit out of Clubber Lang, just yeah. like Rocky did in uh, Rocky <clears throat> Three. So there is that kind of 
you know, and everyone will be like, well, that's the structure of many classic stories and movies and stuff. But this one particularly, like, I mean, I've been a Batman fan my whole life. I never really get the whole Batman got soft. Like in the Nightfall storyline where Bane is introduced and breaks Batman at the end of it, it's all about Batman. (laughs) Bless you. Gotham is gone fucking nuts. Arkham is all the asylum uh, lunatics been released. So he's got to fight everyone in his rogues gallery and then finally face Bane and he's fucking bitch tired and fucking broken already. And so that Bane has the, with the drugs as well, that's the only way you could get the fucking jump on Batman. So as a Batman fan, the notion of Batman went soft, like, ugh, that doesn't play well with me at all. But again, it's a movie. It's different than the comics. And yeah. their reality of the Batman world is a, is a reality. It's so fucking reality based with the exception of the magic knee brace and shit like that. Um, so you can see other movies in it. And again, yeah. I'm not saying it's fucking ripped up, but you can definitely see. And if you're going to like fucking homage something or be like, hey, I like the structure of this, do shit that worked, man. Like people like Rocky three. So, um, you know, in a story where ba- Batman, we've seen two Batman movies where physically he's rarely ever beaten. Yeah. Um, this was the movie where it's all about just physically beating the shit out of him and whatnot. And then having him fucking rebuild himself. That's a reason to get rid of Alfred too, because Alfred would be looking for him and all this time that he's been gone. And Alfred leaves at a certain point. He leaves. He's just like, I'm he's like, not- a, he's the only, well, he tells him at the, at the end of dark Knight. remember the, uh, Rachel Dawes who's killed by the Joker in the blast. She had written a letter to Bruce Wayne saying like, I'm, I don't want to be with you. I choose Harvey. You know, there's a future with Harvey. I, you know, I'll always love you, but like, I'm going to be with Harvey now. And so she left that for Bruce, but then, you know, uh, she got killed and Alfred, they show Alfred burn the letter. Because he's like, I'm never going to give it to Bruce because he don't need this. What, he's yeah. in utter misery that she's already dead. Does, do we, does he really need to know that she didn't want him, that she wanted yeah, yeah. Harvey Dent instead? So Alfred plays that card finally. Batman's getting back into the swing of things. Bruce Wayne is going back out in the world. He comes back from his first like big night out and shit, and Alfred's giving him a hard time about like, you know, look, man, you just, Lucius, all I see is a bunch of footage. You run around with a bunch of new toys and get by Lucius Fox, making the cops chase you and shit like that. Like you're not Batman anymore. You're too old for this. Yeah. Like fucking let you help the city in another way. Be Bruce Wayne, be you help with your resources, your intelligence, but like not your body. You don't need to do this. They have the cops for this sort of thing. He's like, the cops aren't getting it done, man. Fucking do what I say. I forget the line is. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it's more it's, noble than yeah, that. Yeah. Um, and then that's when Alfred's like, look, man, I'll do this. He, t- he says, get this data to Lucius to find out what they, they were doing. Bane and some of his thugs break into the Wall Street Stock Exchange. And, uh, you know, uh, they start pirating software and, and fucking doing some trades. There's one guy on the floor who's like, there's no, uh, there's no money here. This is a stock exchange. There's no money you can steal here uh, at the stock exchange. And Bane's just like, oh, really? Why are you people here? Like, he just has real cool lines like that. Um, so they leave. They're, what the program they're running, Scott, is they're, they got Bruce Wayne's fingerprints. That's how Selena Kyle gets into it. Um, they got his fingerprints, and so they do all these terrible trades so that he loses all his fucking money. So they take uh, his money yeah. away, and then piece by piece kind of dismantle his life but let's go back to the beginning yeah there are recognizable elements from other movie movies but this movie is uh completely its own fucking flick you ain't never seen a movie like this they take a comic book movie turn it into an epic dude it's like there's a comic book superhero movie in there but an earnest one in the style of chris nolan then there's a fucking disaster movie in there as fucking gotham literally falls into disaster things blowing up fucking bridges scope massive things yeah uh, then there's a war movie in there as well. Like it's it's big. You ain't never seen a movie this ambitious. I know a lot of people be like, "Hey, Avengers was big." Yeah, but Avengers plays like a big comic book, and yeah, I'm not yeah. saying that in a dismissive way. That's what it should be. It's big and colorful, and it plays like a comic book. This movie pl- I, I, plays plausible. I know it sounds ridiculous because he's flying around a plane between buildings and shit, but it, it every piece of it is is played very earnestly and very straightforward and very like yeah this works this works i mean sure there's some shit they create the, the device of this uh fuel pure energy f- pure fuel energy efficient fuel energy device that's going to power gotham but the problem is a russian scientist figured out that with a few modifications <laughs> that could be turned into a fucking four kiloton megaton a, megaton a weapon yes so bruce wayne decides never to use the machine and 
he's involved with an investment company run by this woman, Miranda Tate. She put a lot of money into it, but he's like, I'm sorry, I can't let it be used and stuff. She keeps trying to meet up with him at the beginning of the movie because Bruce Wayne, after the opening sequence, the, you know, the Bane sequence on the plane where he steals this dude, Dr. Pavel, and you meet Bane for the first time, and Tom Hardy is tits. That voice is fucking astounding. Have you seen the opening mm. sequence? It's fucking dope, dude. It's like has nothing to do with Batman uh, whatsoever. It's the dude who played, uh, uh, oh, fucking what was his name? The guy that ran for mayor in The Wire, Calcutty or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the CIA agent, and uh, they're trying to get this Dr. Pavel out of, of wherever they are. And there's two other guys with hoods, some prisoners. And uh, he's like, who are these guys? And he's like, we caught them trying to steal Dr. Pavel. He's like, they work for the mercenary in the mask. And he's like, Bane. And he's like, get them on a plane. So they bring the guys on a plane. <clears throat> and then they've got bags on their heads. And so uh, he opens up, has his men open the plane door. He's got soldiers with him and shit. There's like 10 people on the plane or whatever. And he's like, the manifest calls for me, the soldiers here, Dr. Pavel, and one other. So that means one of you has to go. And he's laying them down. He has the gun. They can't see because they have the bag on their heads, but clearly they can understand the door's been open and they're being hung out the fucking plane. Yeah. So they're torturing him kind of, try to get information. So the guy's got the gun and he blasts it near his head and he's going, tell me about Bane. Why does he wear the mask? And the dude doesn't say anything. And then he pretends that he threw him out for the other guy in the plane that still has a bag and said, he goes, well, he, he's going to, he, let's see if he can fly or some such shit. And then they grab the next guy and throw him, like hold him out the window. And they're calling, asking questions about Bane again. And he's like a lot of loyalty for hired gun. And then you just hear the voice going, well, perhaps he's wondering why he would shoot a man before throwing him out of a plane. And it's a voice that doesn't sound like it belongs in that environment at all. Yeah. yeah. Cause it sounds like an old posh, fuddy duddy British man. And they go over and pull and like pull off the dude's mask and it's Bane. He goes, if I take that off, will it hurt? And he goes, uh, it would be extremely painful. And he goes, you're a big guy. And he goes, for you. And then uh, another plane appears, a bigger plane, a cargo plane, of, over the plane that these guys are on. And so uh, Bane explains, he's like, you know, we had to find out what Dr. Pavel told you. And, and, and Bob is explaining, like, why they're there. And the doctor's like, I didn't tell him anything. And uh, the guy, the CIA agent, is like, well, did you? Was, he so goes, was part of your brilliant plan getting caught? And he goes, of course. And then they, st uh, the, you could see the other plane. Motherfuckers on cables are rocketing out with the back of the other plane. Like, and it's beautiful aerial photography, man. I mean, I don't know how much of it is. Some, obviously, some CG involved somewhere, but look, a lot of it looked fucking practical. It's spellbinding. It's shot in IMAX. Uh, so it looks fantastic. It gives you the feeling of like, this is fucked up. You've never seen something like this yeah. before. So these guys are like sky diving out on cables and approaching the other plane. And so, um, the, 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 the CIA guy is just like, well, what's ne what's the next part of your plan? And Bane's like crashing this plane, and the motherfuckers just attack the plane, blow open the windows, shooting everybody inside, and they attach cables to the side of the fucking plane. And then all of a sudden, the bigger plane goes higher, taking the other plane up, and the other plane can't fly and just starts dangling. Suddenly, it's hanging like a puppet; its wings blow off and shit. So you're inside the plane. And he does that kind of Inception shit. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, but it's more practical. Inception was in a dream world, but like. He's shooting people hanging and floating in the air. It's it's surreal. It looks fucking cool. And then they hook up uh, this Dr. Pavel guy to a corpse that they brought in and give him a quick blood transfusion so Pavel's blood is in this dude's body. And there's another guy who was the co-prisoner that was caught with him. Bane is putting on a harness. They're putting a harness on Dr. Pavel to get him out of there. And then the other guy goes put on a harness. He's like, no, brother. No, he goes, no. They'll be looking for one of us in the wreckage, brother. Because like a kind of cult mentality. Yeah. So the guy just kind of goes calm, gives him back the rope, and he goes, have we started a fire? And he goes, yes, the fire rises. And then he hooks up himself with Dr. Pavel, and he goes, uh, uh, what is it? Don't. He's, uh, this isn't the time to fear. That comes later. And he presses this button. Fucking cables give out, and the plane drops, and he's just holding on to this one cable with Dr. Pavel. And Boom, the guy and his the people, the dead bodies, the CIA people, as well as the guy yeah, yeah, who was yeah. in collusion with one of the one of the League of Shadow, I wouldn't say members, but one of the Bane's army, he goes down to. It's fucking fantastic opening scene. It it plays 
Again, it had nothing to do with Batman, but it's just fucking spooky. This dude in the face gear, the way he's talking, you get the Hans Zimmer score right away. That is my favorite Hans Zimmer piece in the entire movie. It's called The Fire Rises. Um, it, it's, it's so fucking tension ridden. The whole time you're like, what the fuck's going on? What is going on? What is going Somebody help this guy. Like it, you get so wrapped up in it. And then you don't see Bane for a little bit again, but every time you see him, it's amazing. We come to a Gotham, Scott, where, Bruce Wayne hasn't been Batman in eight years. Since but the he's events. living there. He's still living at Wayne Manor, and there's a big event happening at Wayne Manor celebrating Harvey Dent Day. And Wayne Manor's been rebuilt. In Batman Begins, it was destroyed by Ra's al Ghul and the yeah. League of Shadows. In, in, ba- in The Dark Knight, he was living in Wayne Tower instead. Now he's back at the manor, and it's been looks pretty much like it did in Batman Begins. And he doesn't come to the party, and everybody's talking about him at the party, going like, "Wayne hasn't been seen in one of these events in years." He's, you know, kind of like talking about him being like Howard Hughes, like this guy Daggett who's trying to take control of Wayne Enterprises. Like everybody knows he's got eight inch nails, and he's peeing in mason jars and stuff like that. He's talking to Miranda Tate, who's trying to see Bruce Wayne about this clean energy project that he shut down years prior. But Bruce Wayne won't be seen by anybody. You see Alfred again, um, and Alfred gives a, uh, a whole staff is there in the kitchen. And he's looking for someone in particular who's not there. So he says to this one serving girl or whatever, yeah, yeah. She's a chick wearing black and white. And he's like, take this tray to the east wing. Open the door with this key, put the tray on the table, and then leave. You know, that's it. Yeah, so yeah. she brings the tray up there, puts it on the table. You see that shot in one of the first trailers. Um, they're kind of pushing in toward the tray of food. So while she's there, she's looking at what are clearly personal artifacts, very few, of, of Bruce Wayne. And she sees a picture of his parents that's like left over from the fire. It's burned from when the mansion went down. And, um, then the next time you see her, you know, she, they cut to something else. And then she's looking at an archery set, some arrows in it, and it's hit by another arrow and she freaks. Anne Hathaway did a really good job. Like I could care less about Anne Hathaway going into this movie. People were like, Anne Hathaway, Catwoman. And I've seen her in some stuff, some stuff I liked. I really liked her in Rachel getting married. Um, some stuff and, and Devil Wears Prada, some shit I could care less. But I thought she did a really good job, man. She's like a good actress, really cool. Like, like I was impressed, and not just like she was a good Catwoman. She's a really good actress. So she's uh, there with Bruce Wayne, and and she's suddenly wearing pearls, and he's kind of like, those look very familiar to a pair of my mother's pearls that I have in the safe right here, that the manufacturer told me was, you know, nobody could was unbreakable, uncrackable. You know, and she's the whole time she's playing like, can I help you, Mr. Wayne? And the servant. And finally she cracks and she's like, oops, you know, and she's, uh, yeah, yeah. and they play this little kind of cat woman score behind her, this piano score. And so he's on the cane and she's like, look, you wouldn't beat up a girl the same way I wouldn't beat up a cripple. And she knocks his cane out and he falls down. And she jumps up to the window and she's like, good night, Mr. Wayne. She flips out the window and boom. And he kind of lets her go. And then when he's talking to Alfred later on, he figures out that, there's some dust on the safe. She didn't just steal the pearls and the pearls he's not worried about because there's a tracking device on them. He said, there's some fingerprint dust on the safe. She was dusting for prints. So boom, the mystery she, starts. Yeah, beginning. Yeah. <clears throat> and then there's a lot, I'll be honest with you. The opening sequence, thank God it's as tits as it is, man. The fucking Bane sequence. And it's like six, eight minutes long, whatever it is. Because Batman, you don't see Batman in the outfit. You don't see Batman himself for about 30 minutes into it. There's a lot of build up to the return of Batman because he's been gone all this time. You meet a young cop, uh, played by Joe Gordon Levitt named John Blake, who uh, seems very interested in Batman history and is, quizzes Commissioner Gordon on the rooftop about what happened that night eight years ago when a Batman, you know, killed Harvey Dent and whatnot. <laughs> he's like, it didn't make sense to you, did it? He's going, he just helps the city and then suddenly turns on him, blah, blah, blah. And you can tell Commissioner Gordon is still like partial to the Batman. Yeah. So this kid's threaded throughout the whole movie. He's in it a bunch and does one of the most irritating things. And again, I'm a big fan of this movie, but what, they, I don't know why, but every time they make a Batman movie, everybody's got to know who fucking Batman is. Like this guy goes to meet Bruce Wayne at one point and he sits down and, you know, he's, he's like, uh, the commissioner, you know, is kind of hoping Batman would come back or something like Commissioner Gordon's been shot. He's in the hospital. Yep. Um, you know, we need the Batman to come back. And he's just like, I, and, and that's you. Essentially, he says, I know you're Batman. 
And he tells a story about how he knows he's Batman. And, you know, it's like, I guess you could be like, wow, what a master detective he is. He was a boy from an orphanage, St. Swithin's, um, who lost, he lost his mom in a car accident or something like that or to drink. And then he lost his dad in a car accident or vice versa. So he was an orphan. He was raised there. And Bruce Wayne, of course, is the world's most famous orphan, billionaire orphan. Um, and so he came to visit St. Swithin's when he was a kid. And he said he knew just by looking at Bruce Wayne that he was Batman because I know the pain he's going. Everyone wants you to smile and get over it, you know, it's tragedy in your life and stuff. But, you know, we can't. We can't let it go. And he's going, I just mask up. I just smile. And that's how I learn to deal with it and give people what they want. And he's going, but I saw you and I recognize I, I knew well, the moment he goes, the moment I looked at you, I knew. And come on, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, I go all fucking hats off to Joe Gordon. Love did a really nice performance on that fucking monologue and whatnot. But is it that serious? Is it that easy to figure out who Batman is? It hasn't been ever in the comics that easy to figure out who Batman Somebody is. Somebody was like <clears throat> every orphan in the world. is like, he's Batman. Yeah. You know who Batman is? Uh, an orphan like us. It's, it's just, I don't know. It's a tiny thing, but it's, it's a huge fucking plot point, dude, where this dude comes to Wayne Manor and tells Bruce Wayne, like, I know you're Batman and Batman should come back and then leaves. And then Batman does come back. So suddenly there's this, now this cop that knows that Bruce Wayne is Batman, which he figured out all on his own and shit. But don't you worry, because that cop, he's going to be a central figure. There's only one way that Bruce Wayne could ever go live happily ever after if he knew that someone would be around to protect Gotham in his stead. So the whole movie, Scott, they're leaving pieces, spoilers, huge fucking spoilers, uh, that this dude could be the next Batman. In fact, I mean, look, I won't even be precious about it. The last image of the movie after you see Bruce Wayne smile at Alfred is this kid was given, you know, Bruce Wayne's will is being read and this kid winds up, he goes into uh, the Wayne offices and and I said, you have something for a John Blake? And she's like, no, not on this list. And he's like, I guess maybe you have to use my legal name. And he gives her a license. She goes, oh yeah, here, this is your package. And she goes, you should use your real name. It's really, it's, it's, it's she goes, you should use your, you got a nice name. You should use it. Uh, and she says his name and she goes, Robin, that's his name. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting a little t- I don't even know why that made me for a second I was getting a little emotional because in the movie I was like oh man like that's why I couldn't have been Dick Grayson like why yeah, couldn't yeah. If in a world where it's like John Blake is clearly not your name because we wanted to mislead the audience but your real name apparently is and it could have just been Dick Grayson but the idea is he's he's not gonna you know they're this is not the comic Scott they do yeah, like yeah. to do their own thing and I guess the poet the poet you know the poetry of the moment is if Joe Gordon Levitt does indeed go on in the reality of this movie, not in fucking sequels and shit. Yeah. But if he does go on and uh, uh, assume the mantle of the bat, then he is both Batman and Robin. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of sweet, but unnecessary for a comic book fan. <laughs> you just wanted him to say Dick Grayson so badly. You just wanted her to be like, the moment she was like, you should, he goes, We'll see if it's under my legal name. You're like, oh, God. You're like, dick, 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 dick. dick. I hope I see so much dick on that screen in a minute. It's like pornography. Oh, give me a big <laughs> fist full of dick right Smack now. Smack me in the face with huge dick. And they say Robin. I'm like, ah, little Robin dick. Um, so there's uh, this cop is uh, being groomed like to become the fucking eventually to become the batman the last image of the movie is him in the bat cave like the package he got from wayne enterprises in the will was like a fucking uh, look like a walkie talkie or a compass some sort of a gps probably gotcha. that's what it was now that i think about it and some coordinates and the coordinates led him to the the waterfall which is the entrance to the bat cave and so you see him swing through and this is all done in cross cuts with like lucius fox going like look into the fucking uh, autopilot. The autopilot. Yeah, hey, it works, you idiot. And then <laughs> the fucking shot of Michael Caine seeing um, Christian Bale. Um, he swings into the back cave and then he's walking forward toward like the, the north wall, the south wall, whatever that you saw in the Batman Begins. And as he's walking in this version, iteration of the back cave, um, there are lots of rising platforms that come out of the water and shit. So as he's walking, all of a sudden, poof, the platform <laughs> raises and it raises into a black screen and this is dark night rise really nice way to end the movie because you're like holy shit the adventure is over for bruce and he's happy yeah, and yeah. he's smiling with but selena still Kyle. A batman. there will always be a batman and hit the adventures is beginning and this and they they seed it nicely and as much as like 
you know, every step of the way, he goes from being a cop in blue to being a detective to being disenfranchised. He shoots somebody and he, he has a little a re- a repellent reaction to it. Like he gets attacked and shit. And at one point the guy's choking him and he has his gun and he fires behind him and it ricochets off a fucking truck into the dude's back and kills him. And then Joe Gordon Levitt looks at the gun and throws it to the side in a kind of, you know, Batman esque. Yeah, yeah. Like, I did this weapon. This is, man has made it too easy to kill. This is the weapon of the enemy, like straight out of Dark Knight Returned. The kind of expression that says, yeah, this kid, he don't like guns either, just like the Batman. There are wonderful moments throughout the movie where they touch on shit like that, where he's fighting side by side with Catwoman. She's all gun friendly. So she's taking out guns and shooting motherfuckers, and he punches it out of her hand, punches someone else. She punches someone else. They spin back. And she's like, you got to be shitting me. And he's just like, no guns, no killing. She's like, where's the fun in that? And they go back to fighting and shit. So little beats like that. Like yeah. I remember when I saw Batman Returns, there was a beat like in those movies, he rarely interacts with Commissioner Gordon. Yeah, it's yeah. not the comic book relationship where they're like b- b- tight allies. Like in Batman Returns, they have the shot after he takes on the Red Triangle Circus Gang uh, where he's walking on one level and and commissioner gordon's walking slightly below him he's like thank you for saving the city batman and um he says like uh the red triangle the red triangle gangs back in town is like, we'll see but it's very gruff interaction yeah. with him and not very like uh not not the batman you would think of but later on in the movie i think uh i think it's michael keaton has this one moment where shrek is like uh you know, you've you've not just saved a man, you've saved a city in the sewers. And then Michael Keaton like pushes him backwards, like, shut up, you're going to jail. And that is a Batman thing. Yeah. You know, especially in a movie where we just saw him stick a time bomb in yeah, some strong man's pants. belt. Yeah, you know, that ain't a Batman thing to do. So you seize in those old movies, you'd seize on little Batman moments like that and be like, Oh God, thank God, something recognizable. In this movie, there are lots of recognizable moments. His commitment to like not using a gun, um, and I guess that's about it. No, there's lots, <laughs> but that one really leaps to mind. Um, so Catwoman steals Bruce Wayne's fingerprints. She's uh, next time you see her, she's trying to sell them to the dude who wanted them. You don't know who he is yet. He double crosses her. They ain't gonna give her the right money. She uh, had a congressman she kidnapped from Wayne's party, kind of some dude who wants to sleep with her. Who uh, she lets the dude use that dude's cell phone. So the cops descend on the place and she's got to escape with her life. And so she fights and you get to see how fucking tits up she is. Pun intended, no pun intended because she's yep. a woman. But uh, amazing at fucking fighting, flipping over tables and shit, punching people with their own guns and firing and reloading while their hands are still on the guns. And then when the cops come in, she drops to the ground, starts shrieking like a victim woman and shit, like quickly changes gears. Yeah. And then when they pass her, she just kind of gets up and walks out and shit. So the cops are then chasing these uh, thugs who then go down into the sewer. And, you know, Jim Gordon goes after him with a few cops. The cops get fucking taken out by heavy artillery. Gordon is knocked out, dragged into the underground sewer lair of Bane. Yeah. Once again, as I said earlier, the amount of headroom in this <laughs> in this lair of his, Scott. Like, when you think of a sewer, don't you think of tight fucking places and... Yeah, like, you know, maybe cinematic sewers, you see spillways like in the fugitive and shit like that. But this sewer, like you could live there and be comfortable and happy. And Bane does. With an army of people, man. A lot of headroom in this space. A lot of good real estate. You know how, think about, imagine Manhattan. Like, remember in uh, Superman? Yeah. Lex Luthor's lair under fucking Metropolis? Yeah. Like his is a little more high end and clean, but it's like that big and shit. And you're, you know, it's a, it's a small quibble, but. I, somebody give me a picture of a sewer. I I have no idea what sewers look like. I assume that it's a lot of it's just pipes and it's not big stuff that you can walk around in. I'm Huge sure there's, cavernous rooms. I'm sure that there has to be space in order to do maintenance. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sure there has to be rooms where obviously water, lots of water could come together, and you know, yeah, I'm sure there are, are rooms, but I, I just don't know if it would be the size of like a amphitheater <laughs> it is literally this dude could do a live smodcast there and get like good 500 people on the main floor oh. <laughs> welcome to whatever the voice welcome to smodcast welcome to s- i'm bad I, <laughs> I can only do the lines i'm of- bad <laughs> <laughs> he he will be so imitated dude because it's a fun voice to do 
but I think it'll, it's going to take me a little time to get together a voice with an original voice, like original thought. Like all I could do is Bane lines from the movie. It'll be a while before I could be like, oh, someone stink palmed me. Until you could Bane. Until I could Bane shit like that. Um, so in this underground lair, a little cinematic in terms of like, look at, look at how, look how big look, it look is. Look how huge it is. Eh? He's, uh, Jim Gordon is dragged before Bane. Bane is sitting there. Now, that's the, one of the only times you see him wearing like this wrestling belt. And at one point, you see a wire in his headpiece. So maybe the idea is the power source of the gas, whatever it is that's keeping him. Yeah, yeah, he's got a belt. Somewhere on the belt. I, I don't know. They're not very clear on how it works or if it, it does work, but they don't say the mechanics of it. So Bane's mad at the two motherfuckers who brought Jim Gordon down there and shit. And of course, he breaks one's neck without even flinching like the dude steps forward to say something he just grabs him with his hand and fucking cracks his throat very vader style yep and then to the other guy is like search him and then i will kill you next and then the guy searches jim gordon he finds a speech in his pocket that jim gordon was going to give at the beginning of the movie at harvey dent day and the speech as we hear later on is uh, like an admission of like we all lied harvey dent was a piece of shit i've had to publicly praise a guy that tried to kill my kid Batman is a hero and I'm retiring. Goodbye. But he didn't give that speech in the beginning. He was Harvey Dent day. And he says something about like, I know the truth about Harvey Dent, but you know what? Today, let's, perhaps this is not the time. Like, let's celebrate the man, the man and blah, blah, blah. So suddenly Bane has this, uh, and also Jim Gordon's gun. So while Jim Gordon kind of comes to and looks around and gets a look at what's going on, he quickly rolls off of the platform he's on into a sp- sewer spillway underneath with water rushing and you know they've opened fire at him he takes a hit and shit like that but they lose him and the one guy who was the surviving guy that bane was like search him and then i'll kill you next he was just like he's dead and he's like show me a body and he's like well i don't know where it goes and he puts a tracking device on the dude he's like go find him and then he shoots the guy and he fucking goes spilling out the causeway so they're gonna use that guy to track yeah yeah where jim gordon's body but Hero cop John Blake's waiting on the other side of the spillway and he gets Commissioner Gordon, gets him to a hospital and shit because he wanted to go down to manhole. They set it up nicely all throughout the movie. He's like, let's go down there. And then Matthew Modine's character is like, well, we ain't going down that sewer hole. We don't know what's down there. He goes, of course. It's huge. Yeah. There's tons of headroom. You know how much space is down there? <laughs> I mean, we don't have the manpower to even fill that room. They're doing a podcast down there. 500 people easily. He, uh, he, he's like, we don't know what's down there. And Joe Gordon Levitt's like, yeah, we do the he's commissioner. Like, he's like, no shit. That's why we should go down there. Yeah, and then they have a twenty minute discussion about like, but we don't know what's down there. <laughs> we don't know no what's down there. And he's like, I, yeah, well, no shit. That's what I'm saying. Does anyone not understand <laughs> what I'm saying here? Why uh, is he in the movie? He, uh, I'm telling you again, it's no knock on Matthew Modine. He's good in the movie, but you're just like, was this? In a, it's a two hour and forty minute movie, Scott. So yeah, yeah. You know, any time you could find, but I'll be Make honest with you, I was not like, this is too long. I would have watched another hour. Yeah. But just in terms of storytelling, there are some elements where you're like, unnecessary. And, you know, it's like, show me more Batman. Every one of those Matthew Modine scenes, like, I just could have been Batman. Yeah. One more shot, one more scene lit of Batman in the suit doing something or trying yeah. to poop. I, it, it ain't Matthew Modine, man, returns or rises. It's not what I'm going <laughs> to see. I'm going to see Batman, man. I don't see him in the suit. So I'm punching people in the face. And when they put him in the suit and he's fighting, it's, it's very wholly satisfying. Like, but I just want more of it. So anyway, he gets away. Bane now has this letter or this speech that he was going to make. And you, you're like, why does that matter? And then it comes into play later on. Also kind of like not one of the stronger story elements. Like, I have this speech that Commissioner Gordon was going to read you that I will now read you. And we literally watch... In this two hundred and fifty million dollar movie, a man in a mask whose mouth we can't even see reading a speech out loud. <laughs> but that's how fucking good Chris Nolan is, dude. Like you don't sit there and go like, "This is ridiculous." You sit there going like, "I'll buy it, man. Go ahead, yeah, take yeah. me there, take me there." I've seen it three times, and even though the logical part of my head is just like, "I can't believe I'm watching a dude read a like he's literally reading his lines on camera yeah, yeah. in a mask," but his voice. Fuck it, the cutaways, whatever. He makes it cinematic enough where you're like, oh, I'll forgive it. So anyway, Gordon gets away. That's when the cop goes to see Bruce Wayne at his house. And he's like, I know you're a Batman. I, you, I'm an orphan. Yeah, I'm an orphan. I'm like, an orphan. And I was told. This is where the orphan. So based thing. on that logic. Yeah. Fucking. 
He probably figured Annie out. Annie who... would know that he was fucking Batman. <laughs> <laughs> She's ring knocks on the door. Sir, there's a little redheaded girl with a dog. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and she insists on speaking to you. <laughs> she has no pupils. It's unsettling. <laughs> yeah. We should kill her. <laughs> <laughs> you know why? Because she says she knows you're Batman. And you know how she knows? Because she too is an orphan. She saw it in your face. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Um, yeah, that's... Again, I just find that like, I look, I'll go with you on this. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to look at the things that Batman does in Gotham and goes, well, who has enough money to do this? There's a logical reason to know, but, but the idea that like, but you, but you have to, you your have, parents died. Hence, you must be the dark Knight. is. Yeah, that's sketchy. Well, it's like, it's also like there are many reasons to suspect that he is Batman and I think it's sort of like, it's just one of those conceits of the movie where you're like, ah, eh, you know, nobody's trying that hard. Yeah. But then when you come in and say like, but this one, when he was a little kid, he was like, I knew, I know you're Batman cause you're in pain. I mean, I, I don't get the leap either. I, and maybe I'm not doing it justice, including all the points, but I pretty, I hit them. I've seen it three times. And I think I pretty much introduced everything that he introduced and it's still pretty specious. It's still pretty like, I know what it's like to lose my parents, so I know, so and I, I know what what it makes me feel like. It makes me mad at the world. It makes me want to go out and right wrongs. So I assume that Batman is an orphan, and you know Bruce Wayne. I saw you come into Saint Swithin's that day, and I could see in your face that you were masking pain as well. Like he keys, like you come in with a fancy car and you know, good looking women on your arm and stuff, and you know we were all like, "Wow, this guy's amazing," and all the kids would make up stories about you. Um, <laughs> It's true. He says that, dude. They would like, make up stories about him. Yeah, about like, oh, well, the impression he gives you is that, like, that, that they were boys hanging. The, the boys in the orphanage would be like, oh, like Bruce Wayne is fucking like he fucks a lot of women, or oh, Bruce Wayne he likes fucking he could have peanut butter and jelly whenever he wants it, or oh, Bruce Wayne he fucking like he's got enough money to be Batman or fucking like to be Superman or like gotcha. all these fantasies they have about him. And Joe Gordon Levitt is like, but I knew. Like the story that I knew about you was no fantasy. Like I knew that you were Batman. Again, dude, I've seen it three times and it's it's kind of like it's the scene that for me really sticks out where I'm like, come on, man. Like if it's this easy to figure out who Batman is, like why didn't anyone else figure it out? How come a terrorist? Because they weren't orphans. But the notion that you gone through similar pain and you would somehow recognize Batman. I am not uh I did not see it three times. Yeah. And I don't buy it. Again, doesn't ruin your appreciation for the movie. Perhaps a minor quibble in all things, but and and I love the flick enough to see it three times, enough to see it again and again. But it, little things like that, you're just like, hmm. and that's not even a little thing. That's just like, hey man, he figured out who Batman is. What makes him so fucking smart? If I if nobody had ever told me Bruce Wayne is Batman all this time, I'd be like, who is Batman? Who'd be smart enough, Scott? Rich enough? Who could pull these things off? I would Bruce never- right. Uh, yeah, I would never put together with Bruce Wayne. And they do a little homage to, well, I felt it was an homage, probably not a conscious homage, to the Batman TV show. I mean, shit, her outfit is almost Julie Newmar-esque, far more than Michelle Pfeiffer-esque. Yeah. But they do this homage where Bruce Wayne is talking to uh, Selena Kyle, and he's like, I have a powerful friend who can help me out, and it turns out to be Batman. And she's like, Wayne wasn't kidding. He does have powerful friends. Now, if you're Catwoman and you're fucking whip smart in this yeah, movie, yeah. Um, you don't put it together going like Wayne said he is a powerful friend. I just met his powerful friend who happens to be Batman, who has a lot of artillery that you would need a lot of money to be Batman. And I'm looking in his eyes, just like I looked in Wayne's eyes. I'm pretty sure Wayne is Batman. Even but, she don't put it together. But the fucking orphan boy who saw him <laughs> for five minutes when he was a fucking young pup. He's like, I know who Batman is. So... He, uh, he, it's, it, it's like I said, it's, you, can get, you can get past it. You have to. And also it ends so well. It's a strong testimony for if you end perfectly, note perfect, you'll for people will forgive anything that has happened prior that may better be, to end. you got to end strong It's better than no opening strong is fantastic, but you got to end strong because an audience will, this is filmmaking 101 kids, even Harvey Wein, Harvey Weinstein told us this, you got to end better than you begin. Because that's the last impression they have of your story. They're not going to, when they leave the theater, they're not sitting there going, oh man, wasn't the opening awesome? They're talking about the last fucking thing they saw. So you got to end strong. This dude ends no fucking perfect. So much so that you're like, all right, I'll forgive fucking shit. Like, 
Robin figuring out he's fucking Batman um, just by by looking into his. Uh, you know what was even more plausible? In the Dark Knight, at one point they're sitting at a dinner. It's it's Bruce Wayne, Rachel Dawes, Harvey Dent, and, and uh, Bruce's Russian girlfriend. And she, uh, the the Russian girl is talking about Harvey Dent. Like Harvey Dent's like Batman could be anybody, could be me. And she's like, "Is Gotham's district the attorney, the kept crusader?" And she holds the like a menu over his face, so all you see is his yeah. mouth down, kind of like Batman. You could. If, even when you did, you could do that and you would never make the connection and be like, oh, if you did that to Bruce Wayne, Chris Nolan, you would never be like, holy shit, man. Yeah. You got a real Batman like chin. Yeah. But yet this orphan fucking, he sees him for 10 minutes when he's a kid and he's just like, I knew it. I knew it. I could see it in your face. Yeah. yeah little things like that. So anyway, I can get over that. So at this point bruce wayne's like i guess i gotta get back in the game he's talking about maybe he goes visit lucius fox and he shows him the bat plane and shit like that so uh bane and his men uh come up out of the sewers again it very it does like batman returns the sewers played a big part in that yeah, yeah. as well they come up wall street attack wall street kidnap some people there's a huge chase uh there's a, a nod to dark knight returns because well, there's a cop who like all the lights are in this tunnel you know like an underground kind of like the you know uh, what do they call it in chicago where you go to lower wacker drive yeah like underground and uh there's all these lights and the lights start going out boom 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 in waves and then boom 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 coming back on and it's because batman's on the bat pod and he's got this emp disruptor you see him show up at a party as bruce wayne at one point he hasn't been seen in years and so all the photographers are like holy guys bruce wayne they start trying to take his picture and he clicks this little hand thing at him and you hear all the cameras go Woo, like he's got an emp disruptor. Yeah, yeah. so as batman he's got a one that looks like a fucking gun like a ch -ch -boom kind of gun so it's turning off the lights wherever he is and it kills power for vehicles and shit like yeah. that just like as we know a nuclear blast emp is what kills all the electricity then he stops and he's firing it like a weapon and shit. It's the first time you see him. Matthew Modine's character is like, let's, instead of chasing Bane and the bad guys, he's like, let's get the Batman. He's like, I'm going to do what Jim Gordon never could. And Joe Gordon is like, what's that? He's like, I'm going to nail the Batman. So they go after Batman and Batman, you know, leads a chase through the city and shit like that and then disappears into an alleyway. And he's like, see that? Matthew Modine's like, see that gentleman trapped like a rat. And he's got himself a fucking bullhorn. And I think it's it's Dave Rigor in every movie with a bullhorn in it. We even did it in Red State. That the moment you turn it on, there has to be a... They play the same fucking bit whenever yeah. a bullhorn's introduced. This happens for Matthew Modine. And then poof, lights come on from the alleyway and poof, the bat wing. Well, it's not the bat wing. It's the, they call it the bat. They should have called it the bat wing. That's a much cooler name. But the bat comes out, flies away, and everybody's fucking looking at it and shit. It's a shot you see in the trailers. Yeah. But he just leaves. He just escapes. That's it. Next time you see, there's a scene where, uh, and this is like, I'm telling you, within the five fucking minutes. Because when the plane, when the wing takes off out of the alley, they play that Batman theme. From, 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 and shit. Five minutes later, Catwoman's trying to break into breaks into this dude Daggett's safe, looking for this uh, you know clean slate technology. Finds out that it doesn't exist and shit. She kidnaps him, like goes out a window because they're getting attacked and shit. Um, she uh, she has to leave him. Let me see. Boom. She goes out a window. They go down on a window washer rig. Um, he tells her that it doesn't exist. Then all of a sudden, other people like his henchmen and Bane henchmen start showing up. She's surrounded. She's still got Daggett. And she's like, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll kill him. I'm serious. And then you just hear him go like, they don't care. And you see Batman up top and he fucking jumps down and <laughs> they start fighting together. And it's fucking cool. You know, it's not overly produced or overly orchestrated, yeah. but it's just cool to see those two costumes fighting side by side. And, that's the scene where, you know, he knocks the gun out of her hand and shit. But then Bane appears. And whenever he appears, they play like, basara, basara, disha, disha. And he's coming. He always walks. He has his hands on his vest like this. So they go running because there's automatic weapon fire. And they go running across the rooftop. Very reminds you of Batman animated series. You see them go running yeah. together across the rooftop in the costumes. Jump off the roof. Land on the, the bat. 
get inside and she's like my mother told me never get into strange cars with men with strange cars and she said this isn't a car and then they take off and they play that batman score again done 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 and it just happened so like there are almost two scenes they're not back to back but relatively close where both scenes culminate with batman running the fuck away in the bat wing yeah yeah, yeah. in the bat as they say i don't know i found that a little like i don't know it's just like do it once you can't do it twice um and the boing keeps playing through the movie there's cool shots of it like coming into the back cave through the waterfall and shit comes into play heavily in the third act when you know they're when he's trying to take out the truck that has the nuclear device on it so <clears throat> he's batman he comes home you know he's like i'm fucking getting shit done alfred alfred's like i ain't <laughs> i ain't no i'm i'm i ain't i have had this no more I'm, I'm gonna do it i want to see another wayne die and he's like, I'm going to leave you. And he tells him about the letter. And fucking Bruce is so mad. He's like, you know, you realize what has to happen here and shit. Because he'll never get beyond the fact that, A, that Alfred told him. B, that he burned the letter. C, that he used Rachel against him. And he's just like, you're trying to destroy my world. And uh, he's like, I realized in telling you that, like, you would hate me forever. But if that helps me save your life, then, then I don't care. Yeah. You know, so he's like, goodbye, Alfred. And he le- and he goes up to his room. Very next scene, he wakes up, phone, the doorbell's ringing. He's coming down the stairs. First thing he says is, Alfred? <laughs> Where it's just like, you said goodbye, bitch. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. didn't say goodbye. You were like, goodbye, Alfred. And he still expected the next morning a dude might be there to fucking answer the phone, answer the doorbell. And it's Lucius Fox, and Lucius Fox is like, hey, that program, that thing that they were doing, they stole all your money. They had your fingerprint, so he did a bunch of bad trades, and now you're broke. Now you're broke. And... The automatic pilot doesn't work. Yeah, I don't know if I mentioned this previously, but remember I showed you the bat? Still having trouble with those automatic. I'll look into it. I'll look into it. But as of right now. I'm not promising anything. The AP is ASS. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? He's like, yeah. Uh, so they go into the board. They realize they have to, since he's going to lose control of the board to this dude, Daggett, who's working in collusion with Bane. Um, Daggett was a guy that Bain was a secured diamond mines for in Africa as a mercenary, you know, got his hands yeah, dirty yeah. and shit, made Daggett even more rich. Daggett trying to use that money to take over Wayne Enterprises. So, uh, Lucius and, and Bruce decide that they have to turn to Miranda Tate. Cause she's a board member, give her control of the board. Cause otherwise Daggett will fucking turn on the machine and yeah. they have to convince Miranda, even though she's invested in it to not turn on the machine because if you do, it could be turned into this nuclear device. And she's like, Bruce, what if I told you the Russian scientist that wrote that paper died six months ago in a plane crash? Like, there's nothing to worry about. He's like, somebody else could figure it out. So I'm going to give you control of the Wayne board, but you got to fucking, you can't turn this machine on. And she's like, okay. <clears throat> so he's out of Wayne Enterprises, goes home. Uh, there's a, well, there's a scene he's driving around with the cop and shit, and they're having this Batman conversation where he's like, it's good to see Batman come back and shit like that. But it never goes, you're a Batman. It was good to see you come back. You know, talking about yeah, yeah. It like that. Um, Bruce gets back to his mansion. Can't get in the front door because naturally he doesn't have fucking keys. Miranda Tate is there. It's raining. They're soaking wet. They get inside. Uh, they start, you know, she's like, I'll take good care of your company, Bruce. You look after your parents' ideals. And, you know, she picks up a picture of Rachel Dawes. She said, who this? And you don't want to talk about it. And they get tender and suddenly they're kissing. The lights go out and he's like, they turned my power off, which I'm like, that's, that's like something out of Zack and Mary. Too fast yeah, and comedic. Yeah. I'm like, dude, they'll leave your lights on for like, there are people that don't pay their electricity for six months. Yeah. Like you don't lose your money in one day. And, and I don't think necessarily <laughs> Alfred was the guy who's just like paying the electric bill. And also there's a Jenny that runs the entire bat cave. What? Don't run the fucking yeah, yeah. manor as well. Again, quibbles. Um, so they wind up making out and then they wind up fucking in front of the fire. You don't see it, but you see the aftermath. She got cum on her belly and shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens. Kids. <laughs> um so uh you know she's uh he's like don't take that off yeah he's like leave that right there leave it you got some bad jizz all over you leave what it. do you mean bad jizz she's got that funny voice and when <laughs> i say funny i mean she's just <laughs> french <laughs> accent <laughs> um so he leaves her there you know she's like we could get away together bruce we could go on a plane and get out of here and he's like yeah maybe not tonight <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, baby. Yeah. He's like, look, I got what I wanted. <laughs> look, yeah. It's all over. Here. We're all done here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wipe that up and wipe up. All fucking the lights come on. Absolute like- lack of logic. Yeah, Alfred, thank you. Turn the lights on. He just claps. He's like, <laughs> he's like, boy, you're easy to fool, man. 
Um, French chicks. <laughs> They're so horny. Right, Alfred? Yeah, right, sir. She had an orgasm the size of a tangerine. Um, so she uh, he leaves her there asleep on the floor. He's like, not tonight. I got something to do. And he puts on a suit because he had talked to Selena Kyle as Bruce Wayne and said, can you, can you, can you, my friend, my powerful friend wants to meet Bane. And in exchange for that, he'll give you that clean slate technology you're looking for. It really does exist. So she's like, all right. So he meets her in, in, uh, at the, in the subway, at the head of the subway entry. Um, as you're heading down into the, the deep earth of Gotham, it's a mixture of the sewers and the train lines or something yeah, like yeah. that. So, you know, she's like, uh, and he's like, take me to Bane. And she's like, you asked for it. And so they go and there's a cool little sequence like montage where, you know, the, his army's all around. So they got to take him out. She's like, you know, uh, there he's, she's like, they're not regular. F- soldiers or regular fighters like i'm not a regular guy either like some <laughs> kind of braggy kind of, i never i haven't had a decent shit in years <laughs> <laughs> i need that of you so he just mess, makes it like it's too boasty man yeah for him to make that comment again like good batman doesn't really say that much yeah like in terms of like she's like some of these guys are really good he wouldn't be like yeah but i'm better like he'd just be like, I'll, "Deeds, not words." Yeah, Batman yeah. will just break a neck and be like, "There's nothing need be said." But, well, he won't yeah. break a neck. Well, he could break a neck, but he wouldn't end their life. Yeah, you know what I'm he saying. He would just fake paralyze them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> give him a poor life, Scott. I guess, but he won't end it because he's got a code of some sort. So they're walking through the tunnels and, and fucking like people are coming at him with guns, and she's like behind you, and he's upside down, and fucking pff, cape goes around. A little nod back to Batman begins kicking ass is a shot cool shot you might have seen it in one of the tv spots where motherfuckers like firing a lot of a lot of ak-47 a lot of automatic weapon fire that's what makes the colorado thing even more tragic but a lot of firing of automatic weapons guys like firing into the dark and you know the light of the gun the firing of the bullets is creating a strobe effect and you just see batman moving from like way the back of the room to over here to over here to over here and each blast of shots like he's illuminated in a different place and finally he's right on top of the guy and so they get to uh this area she's like it's just up here and he walks through this gate and fucking she hits a button and the cage comes down which to me felt like another little homage to yeah, the yeah. batman tv show like the death trap if you will and he's like what did you do and uh <laughs> she's like i just yeah, she's like I do obviously must. you are trapped <laughs> and uh he's like you've made a big mistake and she and then you hear not as big as the mistake you've made i'm afraid and turn around and bane's revealed and then they have the fight and she watches the whole fucking fight and at the top of the fight he goes uh you know he calls him mr wayne so he knows who batman is yeah yeah uses his name and then he's Batman goes at him. It's so sad, dude. Batman goes at him with a series of fucking moves, and it's like he's hitting a rhinoceros. And like this dude doesn't even affect to it. And, and fucking, he just can't hit this dude in yeah. any way that's meaningful. <clears throat> so he's having one of these movie fights where the dude is so strong and fucking effortless at this fight that he can maintain a fucking villain monologue the whole time. Yeah. So he's talking to him. It's cool moments, man. Like he's got Bruce against the ropes and shit. Batman gets the ropes. So Batman throws out like um, you know, something that like lights up, like <laughs> little explosions and shit. And he's like, ah, theatricality and deception. He's going, um, it's 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 a distraction for the uninitiated, but we are initiated, aren't we, Bruce? Members of the League of Shadows, and it's it's cool, man. He's he's talking. Batman ain't talking back, and he can he can fight. And since you don't have to watch him speak because he's got this mask on, it looks so much cooler than if he if you were just seeing him talk. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Because he just looks like this hulking mass of flesh with this mask on and. and a voice that echoes almost everywhere. So he, they fight big time and he just fucking beats the shit out of him. He has some other cool shit where he's just like Batman's down on the ground. He hits something on his belt and all the lights go out and he's like, ah, you think the shadows are your ally? He's going, but you've merely adopted them. I was born in darkness. And he does a whole fucking monologue about how I didn't see the light until I was 18 or something like that. And, uh, and then suddenly just fucking does this quick move and grabs Batman out of the dark. Like he can see him and shit. Yeah. Throws, beats the fuck out and throws him down, pounds his fucking graphite helmet. Bang, bang, bang. You just see it crack and fucking dent. He's punching him so hard in the fucking head. 
And then he's like, uh, uh, he's he's down. He's kind of beat up pretty bad. He ain't getting back up. And Bane has a moment to be like, I will show you where I've built my new home. And then I will break you. And he puts off an explosive charge. Ceiling collapses and you see one of the tumblers. So it's right under the armory. He's like, right beneath the precious armory. And then uh, Batman tries to get up and, um, you know, he's like, ah, and he's just like, I was wondering what would break first, your spirit. And he fucking poof, 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 grabs him, fucking picks him up over his head or your body bang. And he fucking he breaks his back. So fucked up. So and like it's a movie and you kind of had to know it was coming based on the comics, but it's fucked up. It's so, I don't know how else to describe him. 41 years old. It shouldn't be fucked up. But I was like, oh my God. Like I cringed. You yeah. fucking, the sound effect, the fucking, just the look of it. It's not like there's, and probably because there's no fucking like big ass score, man. It's a real red state kind of moment. Just score free. The whole fight is brutal. Just the dialogue, the punches. He keeps cutting to people in Bane's army who aren't even watching. They're just looking forward, dead eyed and shit. Cause they all know there ain't no move here. Like this fucking man is going to beat yeah, the Batman. Yeah. <clears throat> and then he, he breaks his fucking back it's quick. It's not like, ah, ah, you know, Batman doesn't fucking scream in pain or anything like that. Boom over his knee and to the fucking floor. And then he picks up half the helmet, the broken half and fucking throws it to the side. Awesome. Awesome. Fucking. You're like, holy shit, man. And that's like an hour and change into the movie or something, maybe an hour. And that's when the movie really kicks in the whole plot, which is, they're taking over Gotham. They blow the fucking bridges. They blow the football stadium. You've probably seen yeah. that in the trailer and shit. They come out with this device, you know, the, the device that was meant to be clean energy. If you change one thing, and that's what they kidnapped Dr. Pavel for. They change it, and then they pull out the core, and they turn it into a nuclear weapon that's mobile. And so essentially it's a time bomb. It's going to go off in 50 days or something like that because it's it's not connected to the core. It's not connected to the device itself. So they put it in a truck, and he explains all this at the football. After he blows this shit up, he's just like, this is the instrument of your liberation. And it's the big fucking bomb. And he's like, this is a bomb, and it is mobile. And I, one, one of you holds the trigger. So he says, if anybody makes a move on Gotham, the fucking anonymous Gothamite will pull the trigger. Like, don't. You can't focus me. I ain't got the trigger. I'm giving it to a Randy. So good luck finding him. But if anything happens here... The Randy's going to pull the fucking plug on it and shit. Yeah. And they do the same thing with the government. They try to come over on the bridges and shit. And they're just like, uh, another dude from the wires in it. Bunny, Bunny Colvin from the wires, the army man who's just like, um, you know, what's going on here, son? And it's one of Bane's henchmen. And he's just like, um, you, you know, we want you to, he's going, how are you going to stop 12 million people from coming over the bridge? He's going, you ain't got enough firepower. And he's like, yeah, but you do. And he's going, what makes you think we're going to help you? And he's like, if one person crosses this bridge, we'll blow up the city. So they turn the army into their army by saying, like, if you do anything, if one person leaves the city or goes into it, we're going to set off the nuclear device. Like what they're positing, essentially, without ever saying it, is like, this is a terrorist occupation. It's like yeah. it, they're like Al Qaeda. They're fucking religiously bent uh, based on their belief in League of Shadows or in this instance, Bane or something like that. Um, it, it's there, you know, they're all committed to die and shit. So, uh, you know, the government gets all scared. They, there's a president, dude. First time in a Batman movie where somebody's like, contact the president and William Devane is the president and he's on a, like a, you know, a presidential kind of address thing where he's like, our hearts and minds go out to the good people of this great city who faced so much trial in the past and they can handle this and blah, blah, blah. So the bridges are blown. Bane's got this mobile bomb device and he says he's going to take out all gotham if anybody makes a move and his what he's saying to gotham is uh, this is not a conquest this is a liberation like the, the the corruption in this city is fucking sick listen to this fucking letter that james gordon the commissioner wrote the uh, this man dent was a lie everything you know is they a thousand men have been imprisoned in here under a lie he's going like I, basically this city belongs to you Rich people have had it for too long. Join my army and fucking tomorrow you will have what you want. Blood will be spilled. You know, uh, 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 what is it? Um, booty, not booty. Whoa, booty, booty will be had. Yeah, we're all going to fuck around. Um, <laughs> like, you know, spoils of victory and shit like that. Essentially, they do this montage of these fucking people tearing. It's like 99%er, man. Like 1%, 99%. They 
but violently. They go in and tear them out of their houses and take over their houses and shit. And they start holding trials and executions, you know, where like they cut to, it's a really cool cameo because he's now been in all three movies. Um, what's his name? Um, the guy who plays the scarecrow. Yeah. Um, he comes back as, as uh, presumably it seems like a scarecrow. He doesn't put a mask on or anything, but he's the judge in the court. So he's like, you have a choice, death or exile and exile as they take you to the edge of the, of the water. And it's all frozen over cause it's in the winter. And if you can make it to the mainland, you're fine, but nobody fucking does. They plummet through the ice and shit. So chaos reigns. The people have taken over Gotham. People are scared. There are no police. They've trapped the police under Gotham in these series of explosions that they set off starting at the football game. All this time, like he's been using Daggett's infrastructure. He's got like cement companies, building companies going throughout Gotham, building explosives into like all these main section supports, the bridges to cut it off entirely almost takes it to the uh, no man's land to cataclysm the yeah. storylines they did in the comics um and you know there's a bit of nightfall in there and as much as bane breaks batman and they build up like you know he ain't the same batman he's been off for years and you know he's got the bum leg although he's got the magic leggy thing on it but still they make it that like look the only reason bane beat this motherfucker is because he's out of fucking practice again the rocky three kind of thing. yeah so bane takes over gotham uh, the bomb is going to go off, but he's feeding people this bullshit live hope. After he breaks Batman, there's probably my favorite Bane scene in the whole movie with Bruce Wayne. And it's when Bruce Wayne wakes up in the prison down in the hole and Bane is sitting there having this quiet conversation with him. And, you know, that's when Bruce Wayne is like, why didn't you kill me? And he's just like, um, he goes, uh, because you desire death or something like that. It's like, your punishment must be more severe. Um, so he goes, torture. Bruce Wayne says, you're going to torture me. And Bane's like, yes, but not your body. And there's a long pause, dude. He kind of looks around and he looks back at him. He goes, of your soul. Such a cool moment. Like, it's dark. It's something out of an indie flick. It's so fucking, it's not a Batman movie. It's not a superhero movie by any stretch of the imagination. It's fucking beautiful and chilling. As these two fucking people have a conversation and he just fucking murderized this guy, broke his back. He's in yeah. there laying there. He's got a hand on his chest at one point. Bane gets up to stand up, pushes Bruce's chest down even more. So imagine if your back was broken. You'd be like, ah. Yeah. So um, he, they has this conversation about what is going to happen in, in Gotham. And he's like, he talks about being raised in this very same prison. And that's where he learned that despair, in order for there to be true despair, you needed a little bit of hope. So everyone looks up this hole and and, and thinks about getting out. And so, you know, he says, uh, I'm going to feed, I'm going to poison Gotham's soul by giving him hope. And then, you know, I'm going to kill him. And he's like, and when you're in the line from the trailer, he's like, and when Gotham is in ashes, you have my permission to die. You know, and that's when he fucking takes off of the hills and shit, heads back to Gotham to run it into the ground. Bruce left in this hellhole, makes friends with a dude in the next cell and a, an older dude who's a blind dude used to be the medic dude. And they start telling him the story of Bane which is like there was a mercenary um, who met a warlord and fell in love with his daughter and they secretly got married and the warlord found out and he punished the dude. He said, I'm going to throw you in this pit in this prison. And he was being taken out there to be dropped into this hole. But at the last minute things changed and he was released and he figured that his wife, you know, dictated the terms, like said, please father, let him go or whatever. And she did, but he was never allowed to come back to the kingdom. So he left and what he never found out was in order to buy his freedom, she had to give up her own. So she was then lowered into the prison and she was pregnant. So she had the kid in the prison and the kid was born in darkness and raised in this hopeless dark place. And eventually the kid is the only person that's ever gotten out of this prison. Pina Nora, I think it is Pina Dora. Um, the only one that ever escaped was this kid. So, you know, throughout the the next 20, 30 minutes of the movie uh, where Bruce is in this pit training and then trying to get out and shit like that. It's all about climbing the rope and getting out and you, know, you rope these guys up and, and then they climb and then they make this jump. And if the jump doesn't work, then the rope catches them and they swing and hit themselves on the side of the wall. But you know, it's, it's fucking hopeless. So eventually even Muse, I went to see it with Muse and Muse pointed out that he's like, you knew he was going to fucking jump without the rope on the third try. And I was like, how'd you know that? He's like, because they kept saying like the only the child ever did the jump. And you know, they never say without a rope, but whenever they show it, she's not wearing a rope. And 
And I'm, sometimes I feel like an idiot. I'm like, why didn't I see that? Like, how couldn't I have not seen that? How did I not know? I've been watching movies my whole life. How did I not know there would be three attempts to get out of that hole with the third being the most successful? And that in order to be successful, he was, of course, going to have to give up the rope. Everyone's doing it with the rope. In order for the hero to ascend, he should do it without the rope. Exactly. And I'm like, maybe I'm fucking stoned or just not a great storyteller, but I didn't even see that. Muse saw it. And so, and me, my, my wife too, when she saw it the next day, she was just like, well, you knew he had to jump without the rope. I was like, how did you know that? And she's like, it's filmmaking 101, Kevin. I was like, I guess I skipped that class. So he's in the hole. And that's where you see the, like the uh, people, basa, ra, basa, ra, dishe, dishe. That means rise. Like from the trailer. He's yeah. like, what does that mean? He goes, rise. So essentially they're all cheering whoever's trying to get out of the hole and they always fucking fail. This one kid made it at one point. Like they tell the story about the doctor who's blind. He's like, one day they left the gate open and like there was a sickness going through the jail and they all had like leper fucking masks on, like the kind of headdresses. And so they went, were going crazy and they went and grabbed uh, Bane's mother or, you know, the woman, the, the mercenary's yeah. wife and dragged her out and they grabbed the child too. But then the child had a protector in the jail and the protector grabs her and fucking stabs somebody else and keeps the, keeps the kid, the child rather keeps the child away from fucking harm and shit like that. So you're seeing bits and pieces of the origin story <laughs> and going, Oh, Bane, you know, and they show this like beautiful little kid um, who eventually breaks out, climbs, makes the jump and gets out of the prison. So it's not until later on, Scott, that they reveal again, spoilers. And if you're this deep, well, you know, there's a bunch of them, the child that they keep referring to that we were always like, it's Bane, it's Bane. And everyone, Batman keeps going, it's Bane. Bane got out of this prison. Bane's the only one that's ever got it out in here, gotten out of here. And he did it as a child without the rope. He made the jump. And eventually Bruce makes the jump without the rope. What you find out later on at the, at, at the end of the movie is, you know, he finally, when he comes back to Gotham, we'll do it in order. He comes back to Gotham. He gets out of the hole. Heads back to Gotham. Gotham is in hell. Fucking like these yep. two dudes are about to beat up a little kid who stole an apple and shit. Selena Kyle shows up, kicks their asses, like not on my turf, and tells the kid like never steal from anybody bigger or faster than you. Sends him off on the way, and then Bruce shows up and says something to her, and she's like has really good acting moment because what she has on her face is, oh my god, thank God this man's still alive because she felt guilty. She backed him into this hole where Bane fucking killed him for all she knew. Yeah. But she's still hard and kind of like, well, fuck you. I'm my own person. You know, I've, I've done what I had to do and they won't let me do what I want to do. So she's still got a bit of a hard ass to her. But a really nice performance beat, man. Like in terms of like, she sold it. Like you could tell she likes him. You could tell she feels fucking horrible for what she did, but she's still who she is. Yep. So, you know, he says, I need your help. I need you to get me to Lucius Fox. I need him because he'll give me all the shit I need to fight Bane and shit. So uh, she uh, agrees to do it, and he hooks back up with uh, Lucius and, and Miranda. They're being held um, in this uh, one of these buildings. Bane's army shows is always there. People get fucking shot. He can't get Miranda Tate out of there. He's going to get out of there by himself first, and then come back and get her. She seems to understand. Catwoman helps those two guys get away. She's like, Bane uh, wants these guys, so she takes – Bruce and Lucius, and then when they're leaving, they start fucking fighting, and they fight their way out and shit. Miranda take gets taken off by Bane. Batman, uh, meanwhile, Jim Gordon uh, and his men, they got captured. They're brought in front of the court. The Jonathan Crane is like, exile or death? And he's like, I'm not going out on that ice. You'll just have to kill us. And Jonathan Crane's like, all right, man, death by exile. And so they send him out on the ice. And so Jim Gordon's trying to walk forward, and it's night and shit like that. And he's, and you know, and you're walking real slow on the ice, and suddenly he sees a, uh, a uh, what do they call like a road flare kind of thing? Like when yeah. you pop them open, they light up. So you see that, and he looks down at it, and then you see the guys with the guns on the shore train on him. All of a sudden, you hear, you know, and the dude reaches for his neck, and he grabs something his little fucking bat dart, and then he drops, and they all start fucking dropping. And then uh, uh, Gordon picks up the flare and you just hear, light it up. And fucking he turns it on. Batman comes out of the darkness and they throw the flare on the ground and it hits the gasoline. The gasoline climbs up the fucking bridge and lights up this fucking massive bat that's on fire. Um, so, you know, and Bane sees it and he's just like, impossible. Because, you know, he broke Batman. Yeah, yeah. So Batman uh, winds up uh, hooking up with the kid uh, again, the cop. 
Cops about to get killed. John Blake, uh, he's investigating. He finds out the explosives or it's not cement. It's explosives. They're going to take out the island, blah, blah, blah. He gets kind of, uh, he's trying to work with the cops who are trapped under Gotham. 3,000 police have been trapped yeah. by the explosions. Still alive somehow, and they're all under Gotham. <clears throat> um, so he's been giving them notes, sending them notes. This dude, John Blake, and finally says, we're getting you out tonight, so let's make a move and shit. So he has him come up to this one sewer tunnel, and he gets up, and his other buddy gets up. His other buddy comes out of the sewer, poof, gets taken out right away. Some, uh, and so a Bane thug shows up and throws a grenade down the fucking hole and presumably kills a bunch of people down there. And then he's going to kill John Blake, throws him off the fucking precipice kind of thing. He lands on the cement below, and... They have him kneeling on his feet and then you've got a gun to his fucking head. And it's good. It's kind of frightening. Like you're looking at me like this motherfucker is braced to die. Like he's closed his eyes and he looks a little scared. It's good acting, really good acting in this fucking movie. And then of course, naturally Batman shows up out of nowhere and takes motherfuckers out and shit. He gives John Blake a fucking bomb. He's like, count to five then throw this. And he counts five, throws it. And it's meant to blow open a hole to get the cops out of the underground tunnel. They could blow up in like a 10 foot hole. And he's like, you got anything bigger in the belt? And of course, as in all movies, you don't hear a vehicle starting like a, a high powered fucking air vehicle. When a plane be starts or a helicopter, you know, when they yeah, even yeah. go overhead, you can't help but hear them. But in movie world, Scott, sound never happens until you see until the picture. You, yeah. So as John Blake goes, you got anything better in that belt? <laughs> the ship, you know, the, the fucking uh, bat explodes into frame, high powered, and it blasts a fucking hole into the the uh the fucking rubble and shit so the cops can get out of there so suddenly you got all the cops out from underground three thousand people facing off against bane's army because you know he's like what do you want me to do to batman he's like uh you've given me an army that's enough get the people out of the city lead an exodus he's like what are you gonna do he's like war on bane you know and so he has all the cops all the cops facing off against bane's army and shit and they you know it's all quiet really nicely set up it's in wall street and it looks the scope of it is fucking massive and he'd been talking to Catwoman at one point before this too and getting prepped shows her where the fucking bat pot is and he's like you know take this to the midtown tunnel because it's piled up with cars looks like something out of the stand it was kind of cool like yeah. all the cars filling it up and shit so he's like you know there's enough firepower on the bat pod to like take it blow a hole let the people get out of the city and uh and she's like and after that and he's like, after that, we got 45 minutes before the bomb goes off. She's like, no, I got 45 minutes to get clear of this mug. And she's like, you come with me. Like, you know, did, you don't owe these people anything from the trailer. She's like, and he's like, I, you know, get, you've given them everything. He's like, not everything, not yet. So he tells her to blow open a hole and he's like, come back for me. Come help me. He's like, with your help, I can stop this. And she's like, I'm fuck this. Fuck these people. Yeah. So, you know, he's like, there's better, you know, there's more to you than that. I got to tell you, in terms of like cinematic Selena Kyle's, and that includes TV with Julie Newmar, she may actually be the best. The one closest to the Selena Kyle origin, most of us know. Um, you know, she wasn't like playing it very big and kind of like, I'm possessed by cats that licked me when yeah, I was yeah. dead. <laughs> very practical, very real and shit. And even when she's being like kind of selfish and shitty, it's believable. It doesn't come across like movie shitty or something. I, it, it, they handled her kind of well. So she's you know, like, like she's in it for herself. She's not bad guy, not good guy. She's just like, I'm looking out for me and, yeah. and mine. So, you know, he's like, there's, ba you know, there's more good in you than that. And she's like, sorry to keep disappointing you and shit. So she takes off on the bike. She goes and blasts the hole in the midtown tunnel. Um, the cops and the Bane army on wall, uh, you know, boom, go head to head on fucking Wall Street and start fighting, fighting, fucking fist fighting. Before that fight begins, though, they're all standing there quietly and then they start moving forward. And then Bane is just like, open fire. And just as they're about to f start shooting, <laughs> the bat comes in, the bat wing. I want to keep calling it the bat wing, but they just call it the bat, which I didn't think was kind of a weak name. So the bat comes in and blocks most of the fire and then takes off. And that's the rallying cry for the cops. Like, ah, and then they all go at it. And so it's a massive fight in the street. Motherfuckers yeah, yeah. fist fighting and shit. And then in the midst of the fight, you see like Bane come down and start hitting random fucks, just looking for Batman. And Batman appears out of the smoke and fucking fights his way to Bane. And then they start fighting on the steps. And it's fucking magical, dude. Like they're fighting in broad daylight. You got to remember, remember when we watched like the Tim Burton movies, they would never show Batman in light 
or yeah. you know it was always in darkness and shit and here you are watching this bat batman fighting in broad daylight and it looks cool like it don't look like you know it's not a dude twisting his whole body because he can't move his head he's got mobility and that suit looks cool in the day they've designed it in such a way where you're like that's not corny that's badass he's wearing fucking armor and shit army men wear armor out in the day why not this guy so they're fighting on the steps it's fucking badass and batman's you know got more strength to him and stuff but not like i can beat you easily Finally, on the steps, he fucking starts punching him in a mouthpiece, and that dislodges some of the fucking, uh, you know, wires, tubes. Yeah, yeah. And you could see Bane's effect. He goes wide eyed and he's swinging, but he's still able to fight. He swings, then backs up and swings again. There's this one awesome fucking moment where he's fighting Batman. He throws him against a fucking, it's in Pittsburgh, dude, where we shot Dogma and, mm -hmm. and Zach and Mary. So throughout the third act of the movie, throughout the whole movie, but particularly the third act, I'm like, Oh my God, that's where we stayed when we shot Dogma. That, that hotel yeah. would have been destroyed if we still lived there. Like it's, it's, you see all the earmarks of life spent in, in Pittsburgh for a certain amount of time. So he throws him. It looks like Carnegie Mellon steps, like with the big pillars where we shot, like uh, on the campus, we shot the dogma scene where Matt Damon kills everyone in the boardroom. Throws fucking Batman against the column and throws such rapid fire punches dude it's i've never seen anything like it. somebody said you got to watch warrior he does the same thing in warrior it looks so fucking badass like normally in movies everything's well choreographed up to block dodge parry blah 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 he's just like bam, bam 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 and it looked fucking frightening you'd be like you would be dead man if you were a normal yeah. human being without armor this motherfucker would he would have killed every internal organ and then batman ducks out of the way and he's punching so hard that he fucking punches into the columns and shit it was tits so batman keeps fucking taking out pieces of his breathing thing and then finally gets the drop on him busts him through some fucking glass doors miranda tate is there because remember he took miranda tate yeah whole time there's a backstory of jim gordon and the cops and miranda tate kind of helps them there's three trucks that have the bomb on it so they got to try to find the one that has the bomb on it tag it and shit so they can go after it before it explodes so um uh Batman gave Jim Gordon this like EMP blocker saying, get to the device and put this on the bomb. It'll stop them from, stop them from setting it off or blah, blah. It won't be triggered remotely, but it'll still go off, but it'll give him enough time. So his story is trying to get the fucking, you know, EMP device yep. into the truck. And at one point he drops it and almost silent Bobby in a mall rats kind of way where he's just missing the face, the hand on the face. Yeah. So he gets into the truck and stuff. So uh, Miranda was involved with them at one point, helping to mark trucks and shit. But as I said before, she gets taken by Bane. So there is uh, Batman breaks, kicks Bane through these glass doors, winds up in this fucking alcove of this building. One of Bane's army comes after him, the one that was holding Miranda Tate, and fucking Batman takes that dude out, beats the fuck out of Bane. Boom, Bane goes down, and then he gets to give Bane the fucking, like, uh, tell me where the detonator is. Then... You have my permission to die, you know, shit like that. Where well, I'd like to think Batman's way more original than like, remember that thing you said to me? I'm going to say it back. I'm going to say it back, bitch. Like, whatever. But it's fine. People loved it in the movie theater. I've seen people on Twitter being like, that was my favorite line in the movie. There's another moment, a line in the movie where a lot of people seem to like, and I was like, eh, where Batman's on the roof with Catwoman. And she's like, oh, after he saves her from the Bane attack thing, she's like, okay, bye. And she takes off. And uh, he goes, wait, Miss Kyle. And he's having a conversation with her and shit. And then he's distracted by something, a light, a helicopter light. And he turns back to be like, Miss Kyle. And she's gone the way Batman disappears from people. Yeah. And Batman goes, so that's what that feels like. But he does it in the voice. This is what bothers me. He doesn't break. He, if you're. You you're do, all alone. You, yes. You do the voice when others are around to mask your voice. But nobody's there. And you're talking out loud to yourself rather than just thinking it. Why the fuck does he think in that voice? Like, well, uh, uh, I want a cup of milk and a cookie. <laughs> Alfred. I need to take a bad shit, but I like this movie. If I can wait just five minutes. Like, is that his internal monologue? The fact that he says out loud that weird voice when nobody's there to hear it. It's one of those moments where I'm like, why not just let him say it as Bruce Wayne? Like, so that's what that feels like. Yeah. That would have been kind of better than so that's what that feels like. <clears throat> There's another moment, too, where Selena Kyle knows he's Bruce Wayne. And still, when he talks to her as Batman, he's like, we have to fucking do this shit. She knows who you are, dude. It's like, At no, that point. I can't understand you. Save your voice. Like, you're going into battle. Save your voice. You got to be yelling orders and shit. Just be like, hey, man, here's the device. Here's the bike. Fucking, I'm not going to bother with the pretense of this fucking nutty voice anymore because a <laughs> nuclear bomb's about to go off and you know who I am. So he beats Bane down. And Bane was, Bane's like, I broke you. 
And uh, he's like, you think you're the only one that could get out of that prison? And Bane's like, but I never escaped. And Batman, for some reason, is just like, but the child of Ra's al Ghul. And, uh, but he goes, but you're the, the child of Ra's al Ghul. And you hear Miranda Tate go, he is not the child of Ra's al Ghul. And she puts a knife into him. And she's like, I am the child of Ra's al Ghul. And Miranda Tate, spoiler, Scott, this whole time, Marion Cotillard was Talia al Ghul. Now, as a longtime comic book fan, you wouldn't even dream they'd ever get so close as to have the daughter of the demon in a movie. That is ballsy and amazing. Only problem is they shot so much of this movie outdoors that the moment they showed her in a picture in a tunic standing on top of a tumbler, and this is going back a few months while they were still in production or even a year ago, you knew who she was. Yeah. You were like, wait, that outfit. And she's standing like what looks like on the bad guy side. So the whole movie, I'm sitting there just waiting for the moment where she's like, Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm- I'm Talia Al Ghul. And she finally says she stabs him and he's like stabs Batman stabs him because they say in the second movie, like he gave him a new outfit that was more flexible, but it makes him more vulnerable to knives. You know, he's just like, how will it do about against dogs? He's like, she'll do good on cats. She'll do good against cats. So cut to the next movie and she puts the knife in between the armor plates right into him. And she holds it there for like four minutes while she tells her villain story. (laughs) <laughs> and her villain story of course is like uh bane wasn't the kid that escaped bane was the protector in the jail the kid that escaped was talia al ghul and he helped her escape and when she got up to the top she ran off and she found her father uh and he came back and exacted an angry vengeance on the prison because the prisoners killed his wife and he references that and batman begins when he's sitting around the fire they never reference the joker not once Nobody ever says, remember the Joker or fucking the Joker's still in Arkham or anything like that. Joker's never referenced. Harvey Dent was referenced a lot, but not the Joker. So she tells the story about she was the kid that got out. She brought her father back. The League of Shadows uh, took her and her father in and Bane, but her father could never accept Bane because he was a fucking monster. His face is all fucked up and shit. So he's excommunicated from the League of Shadows. So she's telling the story about him and Bane's sitting there rolling a tear. And while she's telling the story, she's fixing his device, putting the tubes back in place and shit, presumably to take the pain yeah. away so he can do what he needs to do. So she's like, you know, his, <clears throat> and so his only crime was that he loved me, you know, and he rolls the tear. And yeah. Shit. Uh, and she talks about like the fact that, you know, the best revenge is slow acted revenge, you know, that you don't expect until it comes through your ribs like a knife in the darkness or some such shit but i'm sitting there the whole time I'm, i gotta figure out the timeline but i'm like why didn't she just kill him when they fucked but i yeah, think yeah. what she needed was control of the device which he first had to give over control of the wayne board which he did i mean i guess there there's logic there because i've now seen it three times like in the first time i saw it i was like oh this is bullshit man like she could have fucking cut his dick off when they were having sex and that's pretty vengeful <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah, that's pretty mean <laughs> yeah that would hurt um but the, you know she didn't and i think it's because they still needed one more component to their plan or whatever so then or also i thought about this maybe she fucked him just to take his chi away you know like she fucks him that yeah, night yeah. knowing that he's gonna go get his fucking ass handed to him by bane just to make him a little bit weaker like there's this overarching i won't say like chris nolan doesn't like women but the whole movie all the terrible events in the movie are put in place by a selfish woman who steals some fingerprints um and then fucks him over later on when she leads him to the death trap and then the movie ends with another vindictive horrible woman who's been lying this whole time and wants to blow up all the city um so women guys just like the bible women are villains <laughs> huge villains so she's got this knife in him and she's telling the story about how you know i fucking i got away and it was me and i came to finish my father's work and i hated my father for the way he treated bane until you murdered him you know but now i'm i'm hell bent on finishing his work i honor my father and shit and blah 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 and this city's gonna die and you're and and you're gonna burn with it and now you're gonna listen to it go and she's got the hand on the control and he's meanwhile bane is like roping batman up around the neck they're gonna like hang him off the bridge presumably because some special forces guys came in got killed by bane he was like and put them where they can be seen and they hung them from the gotham bridge it's pretty fucking tight but pretty intense so you see him roping up batman you're like oh my fuck that's what he's heading toward and shit and uh 
she clicks the fucking button right before she clicks the button. He's like, please. Like you could tell he loves the fucking city. Yeah. And it's not about please. You're going to set off a bomb and we'll probably be killed as well. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't want to die either. Yeah. But he's just like, she'll say, she's like, now feel the heat of 12 million souls. You failed Bruce. Like these movies are all about how the Al Ghul family really hates Bruce Wayne <laughs> and hates Gotham a lot. So she's, she clicks the button. But it doesn't go off because Jim Gordon got the fucking EMP blocker in place. So she's like, no matter, it will go off soon, you know, and she's going to head off and make sure that the fucking bomb goes off herself because she's committed to die. She don't give a shit. She's, you know, fucking one of those crazy. So she tells Bane, I want him to live. I want him to feel the heat when, you know, when a bomb goes off and shit. So she takes on, she says goodbye, and she says goodbye to Bane. He looks real sad. And the whole movie, you realize, is about this fucking dude who, like, loves this chick so much. pussy whipped. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. And I said even, I think I said it on, like, Hollywood Babylon, but I was like, they're pushing Bane too much in our faces to be the main villain. Like, really? Like, you make the main villain a guy, Tom Hardy, he's known from a few movies, but he ain't that fucking famous, and Bane ain't that cool a character. And, like, it always felt like there was a shell game in place, and the shell game, of course, was like, he ain't the villain. He's just the muscle. The villain is this fucker. Yeah, it's yeah. Talia al Ghul. Yeah. <clears throat> so she goes off and then Bane is left there with Batman. He's just like, um, um, you realize I you realize I have to kill you now. Like he's not gonna fucking wait. He's like, you'll just have to imagine the fire. And he takes a shotgun to Batman's face, and there's an explosion. And for a second, you're like, Holy fuck. That's balls. That well, I mean, if that was like like just a, co- a headless corpse and credits, I'm like, oh my God, man. What a what an ironic title. <laughs> and the, the dark fucking Knight last thing you see is it says Nolan out. <laughs> <laughs> no, the last thing you see is Alfred at the fucking cafe and he's still waiting for Bruce yeah. to show up. <laughs> and he rolls the fucking tear. Um there's an explosion, and what it is is, you know, in the fucking two seconds after that, you realize Bane took a fucking rocket to the chest. Um, and he's presumably killed. And then they cut over to good old Selena Kyle once again with a vehicle that somehow entered a room that nobody heard it coming whatsoever. And she was on the bat pod and she blew him away with a missile. And she's like, she lifts up her glasses. And whenever she's got her glasses on, you know, it's like a black outfit with the glasses. But when she flips them up, it gives the ear effect of the cat ears. It's yeah. a very clever idea. So, you know, she's like, that whole no guns thing, I'm not sure I agree with you on it or whatever. So then the stage is set for fucking Batman to go out and save the day. They can't stop the bomb. Uh, She jumps on, you know, there there are a few tanks that he's got to chase him in the bat, take out her tanks that are, you know, the tumblers that are not painted black. Um, And uh, and then eventually it's down to her in this truck and the truck's got the bomb in it and Jim Gordon's in the back with the bomb. He blasts the truck, the ground. She fucking goes off an overpass. Truck goes head first into like a lower whacker drive kind of affair. <clears throat> and uh, she somehow dies. Well, she doesn't somehow fucking head first into the pavement. Yeah, yeah. She's not fucked up enough. She can tell us a few things before she dies and then she fucking dies. Meanwhile, good old Jim Gordon, who's in the back of the truck, not even secure in a seat or anything like that. He's okay. He's just like, whoa. Yeah, he's like, whoo, who knew that you could survive (laughs) such a precipitous fall? That's crazy. I banged my head against the bomb, but I'm cool. It's all good. And again, a minor quibble, but you let it go. But it felt like a real Indiana Jones in the refrigerator kind of moment. Like, (laughs) dude, I just saw what happened to the truck. He would have been dead fucking first. So she has enough, you know, frame of mind and then to be like, my father's work is accomplished. I do this for my father. I have my father. There's never been a kid. Is that for your father? Or is that what you're trying to tell me? Who'd you do this for? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and she says her fucking final shit and then fucking dies. And Batman's like, I got to get this bum out of here. I got to take the plane. And, you know, he's like, they're like, well, fly it out. And the autopilot He's like, the autopilot doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> In case you haven't been watching for the last two and a half hours. He's a shit, Lucius <laughs> Fox. <laughs> yeah, but the I asked for one fucking thing. And that's a fucking she, autopilot. She's like, come on, man. Fucking don't do this. And he's like, I got to. And she's like, he's like, you know, you said you weren't going to come back. And she's like, I guess we're both just a pair of suckers. And, you know, she kisses him and shit. Like they both got soft hearts. But meanwhile, he's like, well, everyone knows I got a soft heart. But you're <laughs> yeah. the revelation here (laughs) so they kiss he gets into the bat to the bat i keep wanting to call it the bat wing because the bat just sounds stupid but he gets into the plane the bat the he gets the fuck it scott he gets into the bat wing Uh it'll forever be the bat wing and as cool as it is and it is kind of cool i'm sorry uh and and this is not it's not a competition but tim burton's bat wing still fucking wins the anton first bat wing if for no other reason than that glorious moment 
in the to, in Batman where it breaks the clouds and the skyline and you see the moon in the distance and then it goes right in front of the moon, hangs there for one second, creates the bat logo, yeah, and then drops down and goes into battle. That the design of the bat wing is, I thought, far cooler than this bat thing. That being said, this bat thing, the use of this bat thing is far better than the use of the bat wing in Batman 1989. Because if you remember, Scott, all he did with that was take out the balloons and then get the bat wing taken out by a long gun that came out of the Joker's pants. Yeah, that's true. You want to talk about shit that bothered me. I was just like, number one, Batman's firing at the Joker with fucking guns, which Batman doesn't use guns. And this is in the 1989 Batman. And then number two, the Joker takes this fucking massive armored vehicle out with one gunshot. You know, What's the fakest gun ever? A, a, a telescoping, jokey gun that should have said bang at the tip of it. So, uh, you know, at least it's a better version of that. But the the look of the Batwing and Batman, I still think, looks cooler. So anyway, he gets into the Bat and is about to take off. And Jim Gordon is just like, wait, the whole city is going to be saved. We'll never even know who you were. Like, I never wanted to know who you were, he said. And Batman's like, you were right. And he goes, but please, everyone, nobody's going to f- know, or, you know, who the, the hero of their city was. And he go, and this is, to me, the most satisfying moment. And I'll probably won't be able to get through it without crying. The most satisfying moment in the whole series, because it really, it, it ends it on such a human note. All this bombastic fucking vehicles that don't exist, cities being taken over, fucking dudes in masks, it in the midst of all this there's a really human moment that makes you go oh yeah that's why this all happened and he goes uh batman says we uh, jim gordon goes like you no one will ever know like the hero that saved their city <laughs> i'm not gonna get through it he goes batman goes a hero can be anybody even <laughs> even <laughs> even a, a even someone i can't i can't do it justice so i'm not gonna he goes a hero could be anyone even someone who does something as small as put the coat on the shoulders of a young boy to let him know that the world wasn't ending. He doesn't do it like that. Cause that would be a terrible moment. Batman started crying <laughs> and Jim Gordon's like, would you get the bomb out of here? We can deal with this yeah, later. Yeah. He's like, no, we can't. There's don't no be autopilot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, don't be a cry baby. Uh, it is. It's a beautiful moment. I heard lots of people kind of choke up a little, some tears I've seen on Twitter, people talking about like, Oh, that's beautiful. It's a really nice moment because it's like he never, they've had this relationship. He never knew who he was, never told them who he was. And then before he takes off, he's just like, you know, anybody can be a hero. You were a hero, dude. You saved my life one day. And that's why I do what I do. So he takes off and Gordon just like Bruce Wayne, like puts it together. (laughs) (laughs) He's even disappointed. (laughs) And Joseph Gordon-Lewis was like, I know that since I was a kid. Why am I smarter than the commissioner of police? (laughs) Um, so it, th- that happens and Batman takes the bomb out to see, and we see the fucking blast and everyone's sad. And we, I did the whole thing yeah, yeah. before and that's how it, it ends. And then Alfred sees him and it's, he looks good. He don't look m- malformed or radiation burned or anything like that. Yeah. Presumably, presumably <laughs> what would happen is between cuts, he just ejected, put yeah. it on autopilot, send that fucker six miles out to sea. And that made me feel good, dude, because honestly, like Batman can't die. Batman can't be killed. Batman is smart. Like it bugged me a little bit that Talia al Ghul is like, I am the child of, of Ra's al Ghul. Batman would have figured that out. Like in the yeah, Batman yeah. comics, and again, you differentiate for the movies, Chris Nolan doing a more realistic version. But in the comics, she would have fucking want to thrust that knife. Batman would have grabbed her wrist, probably wouldn't even have snapped it because he's a good guy and she a lady. But he would have disarmed her. She's a she's a killer, like a trained killer and shit. Like yeah. you know, and in the comics, she refers to him as beloved. She loves Bruce Wayne, Batman. But in this movie, she wanted to kill him because of what he did to her father, who she didn't really like anyway. See what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Um. So in any event, so Miranda Tate hits him with the fucking knife. But Batman would have figured that out in advance. In the comics, he would have grabbed her arm and he would have been like, "I knew you were Ra's al Ghul from the first moment." Yeah, yeah. You said at the Wayne meeting, blah blah blah. So she gets the drop on him, which is not very Batman like. Um, but uh, but it was cool that she was in it at all. Yeah, yeah. Talia Al Ghul, come on, dude. I've been reading comics for fucking years. I never. And when they started making Batman movies, you know, you're like, ah, oh, Catwoman, fucking Joker, Mister Freeze, Penguin. You know, obvi- the big tears, obviously. 
There is no way to do a Raz al Ghul, let alone Italia al Ghul, without it seeming dopey. You're going to talk about a character that goes into the Lazarus pit and gets resurrected. He's thousands of years old, blah, blah, blah. He's Batman's greatest foe, and as much as he's like the smart guy who figured out who Batman was, that was a big storyline in Batman comics. Uh, Raz al Ghul figured out that Bruce Wayne was Batman based on the finances. He's just like, who else could afford these things? Yeah. Like something like that. You can get your head around. So for the fact that Chris Nolan was able to t- make a movie where Raz al Ghul is the fucking villain is astounding. The fact that he was able to make another movie where Talia al Ghul is the villain. That's geek Nirvana, dude. That's comic book fan Nirvana, DC fanboy Nirvana. You know, I never thought I'd see that in my lifetime. Like, I'm like, what an age of wonders we live in <laughs> where a, a fucking D level character from a Batman book will finally show up in the movie it, it was it was cool man so overall i really dug the movie if i had to grade them because i see a lot of people going what's your order because for a lot of people this is their fucking trilogy it's crazy i love batman yeah, yeah. so i'm way into this but there are kids that are like this movie these movies mean to me what those fucking star wars movies meant to you and your fat friends when you were kids i was like well scott Mosier's not really fat and he <laughs> liked them too um so a lot of them go what's your order i think my orders would still go in descending order uh two meaning Dark Knight. is number one. Number one. And then three, Dark Knight Rises, and then Batman Begins to be number one. Now, I don't say number three. Now, I don't say Batman Begins is distant three and it sucks, blah, blah, blah. No, but if I had to rank them in order, I think the Dark Knight I can watch from beginning to end over and over again and have many times. Um, the, the, the Dark Knight Rises, I've now seen three times, and I'll probably see a few more. But when I get it on Blu-ray, I'm going right to the Bane stuff. Like, yeah. he was magical. I'm trying to think of what are the thing, the elements I like. I, like I said before, the Hans Zimmer thing. I love the score. Tom Hardy was fantastic with the band. Christian Bale did a great job. Um, oh, Cast-wise, they they were all tight. Joe Gordon-Levitt was good and stuff. But uh, but Bane is the is the real – Tom Hardy, is for me, is the real discovery. Like, they did something unexpected with that character. Just yeah. like with the Joker – you always had an idea of what it would be, but then they changed it completely with Heath Ledger and gave you a Joker that you're like, this is way better. Same thing with this. Like they gave you a version of Bane where you're like, this is fucking badass. This is amazing. And he worked it into a reality where it kind of uh, has an effect. And he made a weird, obvious choice, a least obvious choice. Like rather than give him a voice that is fitting, like just how Heath's voice wasn't really, now we think of it as the Joker, but at first it wasn't very Joker-esque. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the voice that Tom Hardy uses as Bane is not the obvious choice. You would imagine he'd be like, I will break him or something. Yeah, muscle yeah. man. And instead he goes with like, what sounds like an old British man voice. And it makes it unsettling and fucking eerie. In addition to that, uh, like I said, the fact that it's Talia al Ghul it ties in so well with Batman begins. Um, but for me, yeah, I, I, I loved it. I'll watch it again. I, I still, I th- and, and it's not a knock on it at all. I still dark Knight, the dark Knight, uh, the, the second one. Yeah feels like i could watch that again and again and again um not just for heath ledger's magic performance but it just it works like i remember seeing that movie and being like it's amazing that any as much as the first movie batman begins was very earnest this dark knight took it to a whole new level it was just like holy shit somebody literally legitimized something that i've loved my whole life and has been kind of like some people have liked it as well but other people have been like, this is stupid. There's a guy in a blue cape running around the path. This is dumb, Kev. But he treated it so fucking seriously that you had people who were like, I've never liked Batman. And these movies are great. Man. Yeah, yeah. Like You don't have to be a superhero fan to like these movies. So he accomplished that amazingly with Dark Knight, the second one. And in this one, it's it's not like he didn't accomplish that. He's already done it. This one's just sprawling, expansive. I, I love it. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, the quibbles I brought up are quibbles. But still, Dark Knight with Heath Ledger, I think for me, will be top of the pyramid. Then Dark Knight Rises, and then Batman Begins. And I would say one and two on my list are very close together, only like a cock hair off from one another, a few points here or yeah. there. And then Batman Begins is probably a few more feet away from the Dark Knight Rises. But you could see, I mean, it's not like it's a bad movie, but I just trust it's really great. But you could see a dude going like oh i have so much more ambition but i can only do this much now yeah and then be, with success he's allowed to do more and more and that's why you know i give hats off to that guy because he treats those movies for a batman fan he treats those movies in such a way that you can i mean it sounds stupid but 
you can hold your head up high and be like, these movies are fucking, this is good, man. It's plausible. Like this is modern mythology. Like this is why, why, why like fucking Citizen Kane over something like this? Like, why can't you treat a superhero movie insanely seriously and give it, you know, the gravitas that any other drama might have. So my hat's off to that dude for that. Like he really, I would never think to look for this Batman in a movie theater. You know, I was happy with the Batmans I got in 1989 and in 92. So I didn't dare dream that someone would ever treat Batman this seriously. But this is the Batman movie that every Batman comic fan, I think, has ever dreamed about. Like somebody treating it fucking as real as we enjoy it. And it's not saying we can't differentiate between fantasy and reality. Obviously, there are people in this world who have that problem and with tragic fucking consequences. This isn't that. This is just like you love something so much and it's usually minimized or or kind of diminished by mainstream and now it's being celebrated by mainstream and the reason for that is because that guy said hey i'm gonna do this straight up like i'm not gonna comment on it. i'm not gonna be wry or ironic about it i'm gonna treat this like a fucking real movie a dude a filmmaker they went to a filmmaker and and, and said rather than a stylist like tim burton's a filmmaker who could be wrong but visual stylist big ideas and stuff Chris Nolan is a filmmaker with intimate ideas and that he can write large on a big canvas. And the small ideas in this movie is like what motivates people to do what they do? What motivates a man to put on a mask and do the things that he does and blah, blah, blah. And how does that affect him and the people around him and a city like the Gotham was as important to every movie in in the Chris Nolan cycle as Batman was. He played the city as a, a thing of import as well. So I, he did a great job. This is a movie that you have to see on the big screen. You know, don't let the events in Colorado keep you from from doing it. If you can see it on an IMAX screen, uh, absolutely see it there as well. But it's it's a triumph. It's fucking, it's pretty tits. It's got to drag you out of your seat. <laughs> you got to fucking, I was always amazed. Like, I, you know, I was I, when I was talking to Scott before the weekend, I was like, hey, man, make sure you see Darkness so we could talk about it. And he was like, I don't know if I'm going to go. I'm like, what the, the whole fucking world is going to this movie. But <laughs> well, no, I see you're like, we, we got to talk about dark Knight. And I was like, do you think we should do it this soon? I said, well, shouldn't we wait for people to see the movie? <laughs> and you were like, everyone is seeing this movie. <laughs> it was like, it seems such an outlandish notion to me. Like, well, shouldn't we wait till everyone has seen it? I'm like, Scott, everyone will see it at the first matinee on opening day because everyone loves Batman, but that's not necessarily the case. When are you going to go? Uh, probably if I can this week at night, I probably will. Maybe next weekend. Whew, it's been a long show. Two shows. Two shows. We started, think about it. We started on Fat Man on Batman. We're finishing on Smodcast. We are. Isn't that amazing? Um, it's the first time we've ever done like a fucking crossover, two parter. Like, yeah, it's like Marvel, DC. Don't go crazy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking get ahead of yourself. But yeah, a little bit. Like that. It's like, yeah, it's like, yeah. All right, yeah, you know what? That was coming down on you. <laughs> I know. Why'd you fucking slap me down? I tried to put it in the context <laughs> of comics so we could fucking I was have ready some to punch, common ground. Punch holes in it and be like, that's not, his name's not really Robin Scott. But yeah, I got my geek on that. But you're right, man. It actually does kind of fit. Um, so there it is, man. Uh, the dark night rises as, as told to you by Kevin <laughs> from beginning to, to end as told to it's, it's kind of like, uh, that is, it has to be the most spoiler riffic review of a movie ever. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, I guess it's I a celebration. It is. That's not a review. It's a celebration. Thanks for tuning into our celebration <laughs> of the dark night rises. Yeah, man. It's fucking, you don't even have to say that's like, a, it's like me describing the movie for the blind. And mind you, I'm doing it from memory. Granted, I saw yeah, it three yeah. times, but I don't have it in front of me. No, no notes and shit. Um, I could do that, man. I think I'd be a good, like, for the blind kind of guy. Because I'm pretty descriptive and shit. And I you talk are. about pussy, and everyone loves that. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, anytime the movie gets slow, I'll just talk about pussy. Yeah, I'll just riff and be like, while this is going on in the movie, man, when's the last time you came? They're like, this. you're really disturbing these There's kids in really, the blind school. Yeah. <laughs> these kids don't know about pussy. <laughs> well, that's what I'm here to teach them. Like, just stick to the Batman, fat man. Like, Try not to cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's emotional. I get emotional about Batman. Um, all right, man. So there it is. Uh, ba- the Dark Knight Rises. Go out and see it. And again, um, our hearts uh, and minds go out to everyone in Aurora, Colorado, uh, affected by this. Not just the people that died, but the family that left behind. Um, the people who, uh, everywhere, you know, of course, you're, immediately your concern goes for the people directly affected, but 
Um, this is the kind of thing that traumatizes a lot of people, even if you're nowhere near it, man. So talk to one another, sit down, get it off your chest. These kind of things, not best to just uh, sit there way on your head and heart, get into discussions with your friends and family and whatnot. And remember, there's always strength in numbers and you can't let people, you know, change the way you want to live your life. Don't let the terrorists win. They told us that years ago. It still holds up today. Um, go out and see the dark night rises. And when you do, um, at some point in the movie, whether it's before, during, after, perhaps after. Watch the whole movie, watch the credits. Stick around after the credits are done. I can't promise. I don't think there is a Marvel-like after scene, but stick around after the credits in the theater and just think about all those poor people that didn't get to see the end of the movie and never will get to see the end of the movie. And I'm not saying, you know, you see a lot of tweets and motherfuckers going oh, pray for our you're in our prayers and the older i get it's tougher for me to be like yeah that'll help like uh, so keep them in your head and heart perhaps call that a prayer if you will but it's more about just thinking about people who just like you just wanted to go enjoy the fuck out of a movie they've been waiting for for a long time and didn't get that opportunity so let's not dwell on the fucking madman that did this let's think about the lives uh, that he affected let's think about the people that uh, were punished simply for wanting to do what we all went and did and will continue to do for the rest of our lives. So do that, man. You go out and see The Dark Knight. If you've already seen it, you, come on, go see it again. Don't be an idiot. But uh, when you see it again, stick around after the credits and, and use it like a church. Movie theater is our church, really, man. And it's where we feel safest and stuff. We kind of uh, go into the darkness and we're told stories, just like we're told in church. It's the same kind of thing. Um, and it, movies are many people's religion. So if you're one of those people and, and you are profoundly affected by what happened in Aurora, Colorado, you know, uh, that's a good way to kind of reflect right there in the movie theater after the movie's done. Enjoy yourself, enjoy the movie, and then give a thought to those uh, to those folks. I want to give it up for uh, my co-host, my mostly silent co-host today. <laughs> <laughs> I literally, this is the first time we've been doing a podcast forever. My throat started to hurt at the end where I'm like, and I was like, why is that? And then I realized we were talking. Because <laughs> you literally talked and cried monologue. for four hours. <laughs> it was like a therapy session. This is like the end of Goodwill Hunting and shit. Scott was like, it's not your fault, Kev. I'm like, not you, Scott. <laughs> Fuck you. It's like, it's not your fault. Yeah, it was emotional, but I get that way. But I, I, <laughs> I couldn't do that in front of many people. Uh, Scott Moser is definitely one of them. So thanks for being here, Moj. Thank you. Uh, make sure you go out and fucking I will. see it twice, too, because otherwise, if you, I know Technically, you. Technically, I've already seen it once. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, man, there it is. That's Smodcast for this week. I'm Kevin Smith. Scott Moser. Have a week. <laughs>